Introduction The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the history of the world, few persons have attained that high degree of spirituality reached by Madame Kion. Born in a corrupt age, in a nation marked for its degeneracy, nursed and reared in a church as profligate as the world in which it was embedded, persecuted at every step of her career, groping as she did in spiritual desolation and ignorance. Nevertheless, she arose to the highest pinnacle of preeminence in spirituality and Christian devotion. She lived and died in the Catholic Church, yet was tormented and afflicted, was maltreated and abused, and was imprisoned for years by the highest authorities of that church. Her sole crime was that of loving God. The ground of her offense was found in her supreme devotion and unmeasured attachment to Christ. When they demanded her money and estate, she gladly surrendered them, even to her impoverishment. But it availed nothing. The crime of loving him in whom her whole being was absorbed never could be medicated or forgiven. She loved only to do good to her fellow creatures, and to such an extent was she filled with the Holy Ghost and with the power of God that she wrote wonders in her day and has not ceased to influence the ages that have followed. You, from a human standpoint, it is a sublime spectacle to see a solitary woman subvert all the machinations of kings and courtiers, love to scorn all the malignant engineer of the papal inquisition, and silence and confound the pretensions of the most learned divines. She not only saw more clearly the sublimest truths of our most holy Christianity, but she basked in the clearest and most beautiful sunlight while they groped in darkness. She grasped with ease the deepest and sublimest truths of holy writ, while they were lost in the mazes of their own profound ignorance. One distinguished divine was delighted to sit at her feet. At first he heard her with distrust, then with admiration. Finally, he opened his heart to the truth and stretched forth his hand to be led by this saint of God into the holy of holies where she dwelt. We allude to the distinguished Archbishop Fenelon, whose sweet spirit and charming writings have been a blessing to every generation following him. We offer no word of apology for publishing in the autobiography of Madame Kion those expressions of devotion to her church that found vent in her writings. She was a true Catholic when Protestantism was in its infancy. There can be no doubt that God, by a special interposition 
of his providence caused her to commit her life so minutely to writing the duty was enjoined upon her by her spiritual director whom the rules of her church made it obligatory upon her to obey it was written while she was incarcerated in the cell of a lonely prison the same all-wise providence preserve it from destruction we have not a shadow of doubt that it is destined to accomplish tenfold more in the future than it has accomplished in the past indeed the christian world is only beginning to understand and appreciate it and the hope and prayer of the publisher is that thousands may through its instrumentality be brought into the same intimate communion and fellowship with god that was so richly enjoyed by madame kion and of introduction volume one chapter one of the autobiography of madame kion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the autobiography of madame kion by Jean Kion, Volume One, Chapter One. There were omissions of importance in the former narration of my life. I willingly comply with your desire in giving you a more circumstantial relation, though the labor seems rather painful, as I cannot use much study or reflection. My earnest wish is to paint in true colors the goodness of God to me and the depth of my own ingratitude. But it is impossible, as numberless little circumstances have escaped my memory. You are also unwilling I should give you a minute account of my sins. I shall, however, try to leave out as few faults as possible. I depend on you to destroy it when your soul had drawn those spiritual advantages which God intended and for which purpose I am willing to sacrifice all things. I am fully persuaded of his designs toward you as well for the sanctification of others as for your own sanctification let me assure you this is not attained save through pain weariness and labor and it will be reached by a path that will wonderfully disappoint your expectations nevertheless if you are fully convinced that it is on the nothing in man that god establishes his greatest works you will be in part guarded against disappointment or surprise. He destroys that he might build, for when he is about to rear his sacred temple in us, he first totally raises that vain and pompous edifice which human art and power had erected, and from its horrible ruins a new structure is formed by his power only oh that you could comprehend the depth of this mystery and learn the secrets of the conduct of god revealed to babes but hid from the wise and great of this world who think themselves the lord's counsellors and capable of investigating his procedures and suppose they have attained that divine wisdom hidden from the eyes of all who live in self and are enveloped in their own works. 
who by a lively genius and elevated faculties mount up to heaven and think to comprehend the height and depth and length and breadth of god this divine wisdom is unknown even to those who pass in the world for persons of extraordinary illumination and knowledge to whom then is she known and who can tell us any tidings concerning her destruction and death assure us that they have heard with their ears of her fame and renown it is then in dying to all things and in being truly lost to them passing forward into god and existing only in him that we attain to some knowledge of the true wisdom oh how little are her ways known and her dealings with her most chosen servants scarce do we discover anything thereof but surprise at the dissimilitude between the truth we thus discover and our former ideas of it we cry out with saint paul o the depth of the knowledge and wisdom of god how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out the lord judgeth not of things as men do who call good evil and evil good and account that as righteousness which is abominable in his sight and which according to the prophet he regards as filthy rags he will enter into strict judgment with these self-righteous and they shall like the pharisees be rather subjects of his wrath than objects of his love or inheritors of his rewards does not christ himself assure us that except our righteousness exceed that of the scribes and pharisees we shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven and which of us even approaches them in righteousness or if we live in the practice of virtues though much inferior to theirs are we not tenfold more ostentatious who is not pleased to behold himself righteous in his own eyes and in the eyes of others or who is it doubts that such righteousness is sufficient to please god yet we see the indignation of our lord manifested against such he who was the perfect pattern of tenderness and meekness such as flowed from the depth of the heart and not that affected meekness which under the form of a dove hides the hawk's heart he appears severe only to these self-righteous people and he publicly dishonored them in what strange colors does he represent them while he beholds the poor sinner with mercy compassion and love and declares that for them only he has come that it was the sick who needed the physician and that he came only to save the lost sheep of the house of israel o thou source of love thou dost indeed seem so jealous of the salvation that you hast purchased that thou dost prefer the sinner to the righteous the poor sinner beholding himself vile and wretched is in a manner constrained to detest himself and finding his state so horrible cast himself in his desperation into the arms of his saviour and plunges into the healing fountain and comes forth white as wool then confounded at the review of his disordered state and overflowing with love for him who having alone the power had also the compassion to save him the excess of his love is proportioned to the enormity of his crimes and the fullness of his gratitude 
to the extent of the debt remitted. The self-righteous, relying on the many good works he imagines he has performed, seems to hold salvation in his own hand, and considers heaven as a just reward for his merits. In the bitterness of his zeal he exclaims against all sinners, and represents the gates of mercy as barred against them, and heaven as a place to which they have no claim. What need have such self-righteous persons of a Savior? They are already burdened with the load of their own merits. Oh, how long they bear the flattering load, while sinners, divested of everything, fly rapidly on the wings of faith and love into their Savior's arms, who freely bestows on them that which she has so freely promised. How full of self-love are the self-righteous, and how void of the love of God! They esteem and admire themselves in their works of righteousness, which they suppose to be a fountain of happiness. These works are no sooner exposed to the sun of righteousness than they discover all to be so full of impurity and baseness that it frets them to the heart. Meanwhile, the poor sinner, Magdalene, is burdened because she loves much, and her faith and love are accepted as righteousness. The inspired Paul, who so well understood these great truths and so fully investigated them, assure us that the faith of Abraham was imputed to him for righteousness. This is truly beautiful, for it is certain that all of that holy patriarch's actions were strictly righteous, yet not seeing them as such, and being devoid of the love of them, and divested of selfishness, his faith was founded on the coming Christ. He hoped in him even against hope itself and this was imputed to him for righteousness romans chapter 41 verses 18 22 a pure simple and genuine righteousness wrought by christ and not a righteousness wrought by himself and regarded as of himself you may imagine this is a digression white of the subject, but at least insensibly to it. It shows that God accomplishes His work either in converted sinners, whose past iniquities serve as a counterpoise to their elevation, or in persons whose self-righteousness He destroys by totally overthrowing the proud building they had reared on a sandy foundation, instead of the rock, Christ. The establishment of all these ends, which he proposed in coming into the world, is effected by the apparent overthrow of that very structure, which in reality he would erect, by means which seemed to destroy his church, he establishes it. How strangely does he found the new dispensation and give it his sanction. The legislator himself is condemned by the learned and great as a malefactor and dies an ignominious death. Oh, that we fully understood how very opposite our self righteous is to the design of God. It will be a subject for endless humiliation, and we shall have an utter distrust in that which at present constitutes the whole of our dependence. From a just love of His supreme power and a righteous jealousy of mankind who attribute to each other the gifts 
he himself bestows upon them, it pleased him to take one of the most unworthy of the creation, to make known the fact that his graces are the effects of his will, not the fruits of our merits. It is the property of his wisdom to destroy what is proudly built and to build what is destroyed, to make use of weak things to confound the mighty and to employ in his service such as appear vile and contemptible. This he does in a manner so astonishing as to render them the objects of the scorn and contempt of the world. It is not to draw public approbation upon them that he makes them instrumentally the salvation of others, but to render them the objects of their dislike and the subjects of their insults. As you will see in this life, you have enjoined upon me to write. End of chapter 1, volume 1Volume 1, Chapter 2 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 2. I was born on April 18, 1648. My parents, particularly my father, were extremely pious, but to him it was a manner hereditary. Many of his forefathers were saints. My mother, in the eighth month, was accidentally frightened, which caused an abortion. It is generally imagined that a child born in that month cannot survive. Indeed, I was so excessively ill immediately after my birth that all about me despaired of my life and were apprehensive I should die without baptism. Perceiving some signs of vitality, they ran to acquaint my father, who immediately brought a priest, but on entering the chamber, they were told those symptoms which had raised their hopes were only expiring struggles, and all was over. I had no sooner shown signs of life again than I again relapsed and remained so long in an uncertain state that it was some time before they could find a proper opportunity to baptize me. I continued very unhealthy until I was two and a half years old when they sent me to the convent of the Ursulines, where I remained a few months. On my return, my mother neglected to pay due attention to my education. She was not fond of daughters, and abandoned me wholly to the care of servants. Indeed, I should have suffered severely from their inattention to me, had not an all-watchful providence been my protector. For through my liveliness I met with various accidents. I frequently fell into a deep vault that held our firewood. However, I always escaped unheard. The Duchess of Mount Benson came to the convent of the Benedictines when I was about four years old. She had a great friendship for my father and obtained his permission 
that I should go to the same convent. She took peculiar delight in my sportiveness and certain sweetness in my external deportment. I became her constant companion. I was guilty of frequent and dangerous irregularities in this house and committed serious faults. I had good examples before me, and being naturally well inclined, I followed them when there were none to turn me aside. I loved to hear God spoken of, to be at church, and to be dressed in a religious garb. I was told of terrors of hell, which I imagined was intended to intimidate me, as I was exceedingly lively and full of a little petulant vivacity, which they call wit. The succeeding night I dream of hell, and though I was so young, time has never been able to efface the frightful ideas impressed upon my imagination. All appear horrible darkness, where souls were punished, and my place among them was pointed out. At this I wept bitterly and cried, O oh my God, if thy wilt have mercy upon me, and spare me yet a little longer, I will never more offend thee. And thou didst, O oh Lord, in mercy hearken unto my cry, and pour upon me strength and courage to serve thee in an uncommon manner for one of my age. I wanted to go privately to confession, but being little, the mistress of the boarders carried me to the priest and stayed with me while I was hurt. She was much astonished when I mentioned that I had suggestions against the faith and the confessor began to laugh and inquire what they were. I told him that till then I had doubted there was such a place as hell, and supposed my mistress had spoken of it merely to make me good, but now my doubts were all removed. After confession my heart glowed with a kind of fervor and at one time I felt a desire to suffer martyrdom. The good girls of the house, to amuse themselves, and to see how far this growing favor would carry me, desire me to prepare for martyrdom. I found great fervency and delight in prayer, and was persuaded that this ardor which was as new as it was pleasing, was a proof of God's love. This inspired me with such courage and resolution that I earnestly besought them to proceed, that I might thereby enter into His sacred presence. But was not there not latent hypocrisy here? Did I not imagine that it was possible they would not kill me, and that I would have the merit of martyrdom without suffering it. Indeed, it appeared there was something of this nature in it. Being placed kneeling on a cloth spread for the purpose, and seeing behind me a large shirt lifted up, which they had prepared, to try how far my ardor will carry me, I cried, Hold! It is not right I should die without first obtaining my father's permission. I was quickly upbraided with having said this, that I might escape, and that I was no longer a martyr. I continue long disconsolate. I will receive no comfort. Something inwardly reproved me for not having embraced that opportunity of going to heaven 
when it rested altogether on my choice. At my solicitation, and on account of my failing so frequently sick, I was at length taken home. On my return, my mother, having a maid in whom she placed confidence, left me again to the care of the servants. It is a great fault of which mothers are guilty, when, under pretext of external devotions or other engagements, they suffer their daughters to be absent from them. I forbear not condemning that adjust partiality with which parents treat some of their children. It is frequently productive of divisions in families, and even the ruin of some. Impartiality, by uniting children's hearts together, lays the foundation of lasting harmony and unanimity. I would I were able to convince parents and all who have the care of youth of the great attention they require and how dangerous it is to let them be for any length of time, from under their eye, or to suffer them to be without some kind of employment. This negligence is the ruin of multitudes of girls. How greatly it is to be lamented that mothers who are inclined to piety should pervert even the means of salvation to their destruction commit the greatest irregularities while apparently pursuing that which should produce the most regular and circumspect conduct. Thus, because they experience certain gains in prayer, they would be all day long at church. Meanwhile, their children are running to destruction. We glorify God most when we prevent what may offend him. What must be the nature of that sacrifice which is the occasion of sin? God should be served in his own way. Let the devotion of mothers be regulated so as to prevent their daughters from straying. Treat them as sisters, not as slaves appear pleased with their little amusements. The children would delight then in the presence of their mothers instead of avoiding it. If they find so much happiness with them, they will not dream of seeking it elsewhere. Mothers frequently deny their children any liberties. Like birds, constantly confined to a cage, they no sooner find means of escape than off they go, never to return. In order to render them tame and docile, when young, they should permit it sometimes to take wing. But as they fly, is weak and closely watched, it is easy to retake them when they escape. Little fly gives them the habit of naturally returning to their cage, which becomes an agreeable confinement. I believe young girls should be treated in a manner something similar to this. Mothers should indulge them in an innocent liberty but should never lose sight of them. To guard the tender minds of children from what is wrong, much care should be taken to employ them in agreeable and useful matters. They should not be loaded with food they cannot release. Milk sweeted to babies should be administered to them not strong meat which may so disgust them, that when they arrive at an age 
when it will be proper nourishment, they will not so much as taste it. Every day they should be obliged to read a little in some good book, spend some time in prayer, which must be suited rather to steer the affections than for meditation. Oh, were this method of education pursued, how speedily would many irregularities cease. These daughters, becoming mothers, would educate their children as they themselves had been educated. Parents should also avoid showing the smallest partiality in the treatment of their children. It begets a secret jealousy and hatred among them, which frequently augments with time and even continues until death. How often do we see some children, the idols of the house, behaving like absolute tyrants, treating their brothers and sisters as so many slaves, according to the example of father and mother. And it happens many times that the favor proves a scourge to the parents, while the poor despise and hated ones become their consolation and support. My mother was very defective in the education of her children. She suffered me whole days from her presence in company with the servants, whose conversation and example were particularly hurtful to one of my disposition. My mother's heart seemed wholly sender in my brother. I was scarcely ever favored with the smallest instance of her tenderness or affection. I, therefore, voluntarily absented myself from her. It is true that my brother was more amiable than I, but the excess of her fondness for him made her blind even to my outward good qualities. It served only to discover my faults, which would have been trifling had proper care been taken of me. End of chapter 2, volume 1. Volume 1, chapter 3 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. Volume 1, Chapter 3. My father loved me tenderly and seeing how little my education was attended to he sent me to a convent of the ursulines i was near seven years old in this house were two half sisters of mine the one by my father the other by my mother my father placed me under his daughter's care a person of the great capacity and most exalted piety excellently qualified for the instruction of youth. This was a singular dispensation of God's providence and love toward me and proved the first means of my salvation. She loved me tenderly and her affection made her discover in me many amiable qualities which the Lord had implanted in me. She endeavored to improve these good qualities, and I believe that had I continued in such careful hands, I should have acquired as many virtuous habits as I afterward contracted evil ones. 
this good sister employed her time in instructing me in piety and in such branches of learning as were suitable to my age and capacity. She had good talents and improved them well. She was frequent in prayer and her faith was as great as that of most persons. She denied herself every other pleasure to be with me and to instruct me. Such was her affection for me that it made her find more pleasure with me than anywhere else. If I made her agreeable answers, though more from chance than from judgment, she thought herself well paid for all her labor. Under her care, I soon became mistress of most studies suitable for me. Many grown persons of rank could not have answered the questions. As my father often sent for me, desiring to see me at home, I found at one time the Queen of England there. I was near eight years of age. My father told the Queen's confessor that if he wanted a little amusement, he might entertain himself with me. She tried me with several very difficult questions, to which I returned such pertinent answers that she carried me to the Queen and said, Your Majesty must have some diversion with this child. She also tried me and was so well pleased with my lively answers and my manners that she demanded me of my father with no small importunity. She assured him that she would take particular care of me, design me for maid of honor to the princess. My father resisted. Doubtless it was God who caused this refusal, and thereby turned off the stroke which might have probably intercepted my salvation. Being so weak, how could I have withstood the temptations and distractions of a court? I went back to the Ursulines, where my good sister continued her affection. But as she was not the mistress of the boarders, and I was obliged sometimes to go along with them, I contracted bad habits. I became addicted to lying, peevishness, and indevotion, passing whole days without thinking on God, who watched continually over me as the sequel will manifest. I did not remain long under the power of such habits because my sister's care recovered me. I loved much to hear of God, was not weary of church, loved to pray, had tenderness for the poor, and a natural dislike for persons whose doctrine was judged unsound. God has always continued to me this grace in my greatest infidelities. There was at the end of the garden, connected with this convent, a little chapel dedicated to the child Jesus. To this I betook myself for devotion and for some time carrying my breakfast Thither every morning I hid it all behind this image. I was so much a child that I thought I made a considerable sacrifice in depriving myself of it. Delicate in my choice of food, I wished to mortify myself, but found self-love still too prevalent to submit to such mortification. When they were cleaning out this chapel, 
they found behind the image what I had left there, and presently guessed that it was I. They had seen me every day going thither. I believe that God, who lets nothing pass without a recompense, soon reward me with interest for this little infantine devotion. I continued some time with my sister, where I retained the love and fear of God. My life was easy. I was educated agreeably with her. I improved much while I had my health, but very often I was sick and seized with maladies as sudden as they were uncommon. In the evening well, in the morning swell and full of bluish marks, symptoms of a fever which soon followed. At nine years I was taken with so violent a hemorrhage that they thought I was going to die. I was rendered exceedingly weak. A little before this severe attack, my other sister became jealous, wanting to have in me in turn. Though she led a good life, she had not a talent for the education of children. At first she caressed me, but all her caresses made no impression upon my heart. My other sister did more with a look than she with either caresses or threatenings. As she saw that I loved her not so well, she changed to rigorous treatment. She would not allow me to speak to my other sister when she knew I had spoken to her. She had me whipped or beat me herself. I could no longer hold out against severe usage, and therefore requited with apparent ingratitude all the favors of my parental sister, going no more to see her. But this did not hinder her from giving me marks of her usual goodness in the severe malady just mentioned. She kindly construed my ingratitude to be owing to my fear of chastisement rather than to a bad heart. Indeed, I believe this was the only instance in which fear of chastisement operated so powerfully upon me. From that time I suffered more in occasioning pain to the one I loved than in suffering myself at their hand. Thou knowest, O my beloved, that it was not the dread of thy chastisements that sank so deep, either into my understanding or my heart. It was the sorrow for offending thee, which ever constitute the whole of my distress, which was so great. I imagine if there were neither heaven nor hell, I should always have retained the same fear of displeasing thee. Thou knowest that after my faults, when in forgiving mercy, thou were pleased to visit my soul, thy caresses were a thousandfold more insupportable than thy rod. My father, being informed of all that passed, took me home again. I was nearly ten years of age. I stayed only a little while at home. A nun of the order of Saint Dominic of a great family, one of my father's intimate friends solicited him to place me in her convent. She was the prioress and promised she would take care of me and make me lodge in her room. This lady had conceived a great affection for me. She was so taken up with her community in its many troublesome events that she was not at liberty to take much care of me. 
I had the chicken box, which made me keep to my bed three weeks, in which I had very bad care, though my father and mother thought I was under excellent care. The ladies of the house had such a dread of the small box as they imagined mine to be, that they would not come near me. I passed almost all the time without seeing anybody. A lay sister, who only brought me my allowance of diet at the set hours, immediately went off again. I providentially found a Bible, and having both a fondness for eating and a happy memory, I spent whole days in reading it from morning to night. I learned entirely the historical part, yet I was really very unhappy in this house. The other boarders, being large girls, distressed me with grievous persecutions. I was so much neglected as to food, and that I became quite emaciated. End of chapter 3, volume 1. Volume 1, chapter 4 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. Volume 1, Chapter 4 After about eight months, my father took me home. My mother kept me more with her, beginning to have a higher regard for me than before. She still preferred my brother, everyone spoke of it. Even when I was sick and there was anything I liked, he demanded it was taken from me and given to him, and he was in perfectly good health. One day he made me mount the top of the coach, then threw me down. By the fall I was very much bruised. At other times he beat me, but whatever he did, however wrong, it was winked at. All the most favorable construction was put upon it. This soured my temper. I had a little disposition to do good, saying I was never the better for it. It was not then for thee alone, O God, that I did good, since I ceased to do it when it met not with such a reception from others as I wanted. Had I known how to make a right use of this, thy crucifying conduct, I shall have made a good progress. Far from turning me out of the way, it would have made me turn more wholly to thee. I looked with jealous eyes on my brother, seeing the difference between him and me. Whatever he did was considered well, but if there were blame, it fell on me. My stepsisters by the mother gained her goodwill by caressing him and persecuting me. True, I was bad. I relapsed into my former faults of lying and peevishness. With all these faults, I was very tender and charitable to the poor. I prayed to God assiduously, loved to hear anyone speak of him and to read good books. I doubt not that you will be amazed at such a series of inconsistencies, but what succeeds will surprise you yet more when you see this manner of acting gain ground with my years. As my reason ripened, 
it was so far from correcting this irrational conduct. Sin grew more powerful in me. O oh my God, thy grace seemed to be redoubled in proportion to the increase of my ingratitude. It was with me as with a city besieged. Thou didst surround my heart, and I only studied how to defend myself against thy attacks. I raised fortifications about the wretched place, adding every day to the number of my iniquities to prevent thee taking it. When there was an appearance of thy becoming victorious over this ungrateful heart, I raised a counter-battery and threw up rambats to keep off thy goodness and to hinder the course of thy grace. None other could have conquered than thyself. I cannot bear to hear it said, We are not free to resist grace. I have had too long and fatal an experience of my liberty. I close up the avenues of my heart that I might not so much as hear that secret voice of God which was calling me to Himself. I have indeed from tenderest youth passed through a series of grievances either by maladies or by persecutions. The girl to whose care my mother left me in arranging my hair used to beat me, and did not make me turn it except with rage and blows. Everything seemed to punish me, but this, instead of making me turn on to thee, O oh my God, only served to afflict and embitter my mind. My father knew nothing of all this. His love to me was such that he would not have suffered it. I loved him very much, but at the same time I feared him, so that I told him nothing of it. My mother was often teasing him with complaints of me, to which he made no other reply than, There are twelve hours in the day, she will grow wiser. This rigorous proceeding was not the worst for my soul, though it soured my temper, which was otherwise mild and easy. But what caused my greatest hurt was that I chose to be among those who caressed me in order to corrupt and spoil me. My father, seeing I was now grown tall, placed me land among the Ursulines to receive my first communion at Easter, at which time I was to complete my eleventh year. And here my most dear sister, under whose inspection my father placed me, redoubled her cares to cause me to make the best preparation possible for this act of devotion. I thought now of giving myself to God in good earnest. I often felt a combat between my good inclinations and my bad habits. I even did some penances. As I was almost always with my sister, and as the boarders in her class which was the first, were very reasonable and civil, I became such also while among them. It has been cruel to educate me badly, for my very nature was strongly disposed to goodness. Easily won with mildness, I did with pleasure whatever my good sister desired. At length Easter arrived. I received the communion with much joy and devotion. In this house I stayed until which and I. But as my other sister was the mistress of the second class, she demanded that in her week I should be with her 
in that class. Her manners, so opposite to the others, made me relax my former piety. I felt no more than new and delightful ardor, which had seized my heart at my first communion. Alas, it held by a short time. My faults and failings were soon reiterated, and drew me from the care and duties of religion. As I now grew very tall for my age, and more to my mother's liking than before, she took care to deck and dress me, to make me see company, to take me abroad. She took an inordinate pride in that beauty with which God had formed me, to bless and praise Him. However, it was perverted by the me into a sort of pride and vanity. Several shooters came to me, but as I was not yet twelve years, my father would not listen to any proposals. I loved reading and shut myself up alone every day to read without interruption. What proved effectual to gain me entirely to God, at least for a time, was that the nephew of my father's passed by our home on a mission to Cochin, China. I happened at that time to be taking a walk with my companions, which I seldom did. At my return she was gone. They gave me an account of this sanctity and the things she had said. I was so touched that I was overcome with sorrow. I cried all the rest of the day and night. Early in the morning I went in great distress to seek my confessor. I said to him, What, my father, am I the only person in our family to be lost? Alas, help me in my salvation. He was greatly surprised to see me so much afflicted and comforted me in the best manner he could, not thinking me so bad as I was. In my backslidings I was docile, punctual in obedience, careful to confess often. Since I went to him, my life was more regular. O oh, thou God of love, how often hast thou knocked at the door of my heart, how often terrified me with appearances of sudden death. All this only made a transient impression. I presently return again to my infidelities. This time thou didst take and quite carry off my heart. Alas, what grief I now sustain for having displeased thee. What regrets what exclamations, what soppings! Who would have thought to see me but that my convention would have lasted as long as my life? Why didst thou not, O oh my God, utterly take this heart to thyself when I gave it to thee so fully? Or, if thou didst take it, then Oh, why didst thou let it revolt again? Thou wast surely strong enough to hold it. But thou wouldst perhaps, in leaving me to myself, display thy mercy, that the depth of my iniquity might serve as a trophy to thy goodness. I immediately applied myself to every part of my duty. I made the general confession with great compaction of heart. I frankly confessed all that I knew with many tears. I became so changed that I was scarcely known. I will not forever so much have made the least voluntary slip. They found not any matter for absolution when I confessed. I discovered the very smallest faults and God did me the favor to enable me 
to conquer myself in many things. There were left only some remains of passion, which gave me some trouble to conquer. But as soon as I had, by means thereof, given any displeasure, even to the domestics, I begged their pardon in order to subdue my wrath and pride. For wrath is the daughter of pride. A person truly humble permits not anything to put him in a rage. As it is pride which dies the last in the soul, so it is passion which is last destroyed in the outward conduct. A soul thoroughly dead to itself finds nothing of rage left. There are persons who, being very much filled with grace and with peace at the entrance of the resigned path of light and love, think they are come thus far, but they are greatly mistaken in this view of their state. This they will readily discover if they are heartily willing to examine two things. First, if their nature is lively, warm, and violent, I speak not of stupid tempers, they will find from time to time that they make slips in which trouble and emotion have some share. Even then they are useful to humble and annihilate them. But when annihilation is perfected, all passion is gone. It is incompatible with this state they will find that there often arises in them certain motions of anger but the sweetness of grace holds them back they would easily transgress if in any wise they gave way to these motions there are persons who think themselves very mild because nothing throats them it is not of such that I am speaking. Mildness, which has never been put to the proof, is often only counterfeit. Those persons who, when unmolested, appear to be saints, are no sooner exercised by vexing occurrences than there starts up in them a strange number of faults. They have thought them dead, which only lay dormant, because nothing awakened them. I followed my religious exercise. I shut myself up all day to read and pray. I gave all I had to the poor, taking even linen to their houses. I taught them the catechism, and when my parents dined out, I made them eat with me and serve them with great respect. I read the works of St. Francis de Sales and the life of Madame de Chandal. There I first learned what mental prayer was, and I besought my confessor to teach me that kind of prayer. As he did not, I used my own endeavors to practice it, though without success as i then thought because i could not exercise the imagination i persuaded myself that that prayer could not be made without forming to oneself certain ideas and reasoning much this difficulty gave me no small trouble for a long time i was very assiduous and prayed earnestly to god to give me the gift of prayer all that i saw in the life of madame de chandal charmed me i was so much a child that i thought i ought to do everything i saw in it all the vows she had made i made also one day as i was reading that she had put the name of jesus on her heart to follow the counsel, set me as a seal upon thy heart. For this purpose she had taken a hot iron, whereupon the holy name was engraved. I was very much afflicted, 
that I could not do the same. I decided to write that sacred and adorable name in large characters on paper, then with rim bones and a needle I fastened it to my skin in four places. In that position it continued a long time. After this, I turned all my thoughts to become a nun, because the love which I had for St. Francis de Sales did not permit me to think of any other community than the one of which he was the founder. I frequently went to beg the nuns there to receive me into their convent. Often I stole out of my father's house to go and repeatedly solicit my admission there, though it was what they eagerly desire, even as a temporal advantage, yet they never dare let me enter, as they very much feared my father, to whose fondness for me they were no strangers. There was at that house a niece of my father's, to whom I am under great obligations. Fortune had not been very favorable to her father. It had reduced her in some measure to depend on mine, to whom she made known my desire. Although she would not for anything in the world have hindered a right vocation, yet she could not hear of my design without shedding tears. As he happened at this time, to be abroad, my cousin went to my confessor to desire him to forbid my going to the visitation. He dared not, however, do it plainly, for fear of drawing on himself the resentment of that community. I still wanted to be a nun, and importuned my mother excessively to take me to that house. She would not do it, for fear of grieving my father, who was absent. End of chapter 4 of volume 1is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 5. No sooner was my father returned home that he became violently ill. My mother was at the same time indisposed in another part of the house. I was all alone with him, ready to render him every kind of service I was capable of to give him all the dutiful marks of a most sincere affection. I do not doubt, but my assiduity was very agreeable to him. I perform the most menial offices unperceived by him, taking the time for it when the servants were not at hand, as well to mortify myself as to pay due honor to what Jesus Christ said, that he came not to be ministered to, but to minister. When Father made me read to him, I read with such hard devotion that he was surprised. I remember the instruction my sister had given me and the ejaculatory prayers and praises I had learned. She had taught me to praise thee, O my God, in all thy works. All that I saw called upon me to render thee homage. If it rained, I wished every drop to be changed into love and praises. My heart was nourished insensibly with thy love, and my spirit was incessantly engrossed with the remembrance of thee. 
I seemed to join and partake in all the good that was done in the world, and could have wished to have the united hearts of all men to love thee. This habit rooted itself so strongly in me that I retain it throughout my greatest wanderings. My cousin helped not a little to support me in these good sentiments. I was often with her and loved her, as she took great care of me and treated me with much gentleness. Her fortune being equal neither to her birth nor her virtue, she did with charity and affection what her condition obliged her to do. My mother grew jealous, fearing I should love my cousin too well and herself too little. She who had left me in my young years to the care of her maids, and since that to my own, only requiring if I was in the house, troubling herself no father, she now required me always to stay with her, and never suffer me to be with my cousin with great reluctance. My cousin fell ill. My mother took that occasion to send her home, which was a very severe stroke to my heart, as well as to that grace which began to down in me. My mother was a very virtuous woman. She was one of the most charitable women of her age. She not only gave the surplus, but even the necessities of the house. Never were the needy neglected. Never any wretched one came to her without succor. She furnished poor mechanics wherewith to carry on their work, and needy tradesmen wherewith to supply their shops. From her, I think, I inherited my charity and love for the poor. God favored me with the blessing of being her successor in that holy exercise. There was not one in the town or its environs who did not praise her for this virtue. She sometimes gave to the last penny in the house, though she had a large family to maintain, and yet she did not fail in her faith. My mother's only care about me had been all along to have me in the house, which indeed is one material point for a girl. This habit of being so constantly kept within proved of great service after my marriage. It would have been better had she kept me more in her own apartment with an agreeable freedom and inquire oftener what part of the house I was in. After my cousin left me, God granted me the grace to forgive injuries with such readiness that my confessor was surprised. He knew that some young ladies had, out of envy, traduced me, and I spoke well of them as occasion offered. I was seized with an ague which lasted four months, in which I suffered much. During that time I was enabled to suffer with much resignation and patience. In this frame of mind and manner of life I have persevered so long as I continued the practice of mental prayer. Later we went to pass some days in the country. My father took along with us one of his relations, a very accomplished young gentleman. He had a great desire to marry me, but my father resolved not to give me to any near kinsman on account of the difficulty obtaining dispensations put him off without alleging any false or frivolous reasons for it. As this young gentleman was very devout and every day said the office of the Virgin, 
I said it with him. To have time for it, I left off prayer, which was to me the first inlet of evils. Yet I kept up for a long time some share of the spirit of piety, for I went to seek out the little shepherdess to instruct them in their religious duties. This spirit gradually decayed, not being nourished by prayer, I became called toward God. All my old faults revived, to which I added an excessive vanity. The love I began to have for myself extinguished what remained in me of the love of God. I did not wholly leave off mental prayer without asking my confessor's leave. I told him, I thought it better to say the office of the Virgin every day than to practice prayer. I had no time for both. I saw not that this was a strategy of the enemy to draw me from God, to entangle me in the snares he had led for me. I had time sufficient for both, as I had no other occupation than what I prescribed to myself. My confessor was easy in the manner. Not being a man of prayer, he gave his consent to my great hurt. O oh my God, if the value of prayer were but known, the great advantage which accrues to the soul from conversing with Thee, and what consequences it is of to salvation, Every one will be assiduous in it. It is a strong hole into which the enemy cannot enter. He may attack it, besiege it, make a noise about its walls. But while we are faithful and hold our station, he cannot hurt us. It is alike requisite to dictate to children the necessity of prayer as of their salvation. Alas, unhappily, it is thought sufficient to tell them that there is a heaven and a hell, that they must endeavor to avoid the latter and attain the former. Yet they are not taught the shortest and easiest way of arriving at it. The only way to heaven is prayer, a prayer of the heart which everyone is capable of and not of reasonings which are the fruits of study or exercise of the imagination which in filling the mind with wandering objects rarely settle it instead of warming the heart with love to god they leave it cold and languishing let the poor come let the ignorant and carnal come let the children without reason or knowledge come. Let the dole of hard hearts, which can retain nothing, come to the practice of prayer, and they shall become wise. O ye great, wise and rich, have ye not a heart capable of loving what is proper for you, and of hating what is destructive? Love the sovereign good hate all evil, and ye will be truly wise. When ye love any one, it is because ye know the reason so love and its definitions? No, certainly. Ye love because your heart is formed to love what it finds amiable. Surely you cannot but know that there is a note lovely in the universe but God. Know ye not that he has created you, that he has died for you? But if these reasons are not sufficient, which of you has not some necessity, some trouble, or some misfortune? Which of you does not know how to tell his malady and beg relief? Come, then, to this fountain of all good, without complaining to weep, and impotent creatures who cannot help you come to prayer 
lay before God your troubles, beg His grace, and above all, that you may love Him. None can exempt himself from loving, for none can live without a heart, nor the heart without love. Why should any amuse themselves in seeking reasons for loving love itself? Let us love without reasoning about it, and we shall find ourselves filled with love before the others have learned the reasons which induce to it. Make trial of this love, and you will be wiser in it than the most skillful philosophers. In love, as in everything else, experience instructs better than reasoning. Come then, drink at this fountain of living waters instead of the broken cisterns of the creature, which far from allaying your thirst, only tend continuously to augment it. Did ye once drink at this fountain, ye will not seek as were for anything to quench your thirst. For while ye still continue to draw from the source, ye will thirst no longer after the word. But if ye quit it, alas, the enemy has the ascendant. He will give you of his poison draughts, which may have an apparent sweetness, but will assuredly rob you of life. I forsook the fountain of living waters when I left off prayer. I became as a vineyard, exposed to pillage, hedges torn down with liberty to all the passengers to ravage it. I began to seek in the creature what I had found in God. He left me to myself because I first left him. It was his will by permitting me to sink into the horrible pit to make me feel the necessity I was in of approaching him in prayer. Thou hast said that thou wilt Destroy those adulterous souls who depart from thee. Alas, it is their departure alone which caused their destruction, since in departing from thee, O son of righteousness, they enter into the regions of darkness and the coldness of death, from which they will never rise if thou didst not revisit them. If thou didst not by thy divine light illuminate their darkness, and by thy enlivening warmth melt their icy hearts and restore them to life, they will never rise. I fell then into the greatest of all misfortunes. I wander yet farther and farther from thee, O my God, and thou didst gradually retire from a heart which had quitted thee. Yet such is thy goodness that it seemed as if thou hadst left me with regret, and when this heart was desirous to re return again unto thee, with what speed didst thou come to meet it? This proof of thy love and mercy shall be to me an everlasting testimony of thy goodness and of my own ingratitude. I became still more passionate than I had ever been, as age gave more force to nature. I was frequently guilty of lying. I felt my heart corrupt and vain. The spark of divine grace was almost extinguished in me, and I fell into a state of indifference and indevotion, though I still carefully kept up outside appearances. The habit I had acquired of behaving at church made me appear better than I was. Vanity, which had been excluded to my heart, now resumed its seat. I began to pass a great part of my time before a looking glass. I found so much pleasure in viewing myself 
that I thought others were in the right who practiced the same. Instead of making use of this exterior which God had given me, that I might love him the more, it became to me only the means of a vain complacency. All seemed to me to look beautiful in my person, but I saw not that it covered a polluted soul. This rendered me so inwardly vain that I doubt whether any ever exceeded me the rain. There was an affected modesty in my outward deportment that would have deceived the world. The high esteem I had for myself made me find faults in everyone else of my own sex. I had no eyes but to see my own good qualities and to discover the defects of others. I hid my own faults from myself, or if, if I remarked any, yet to me they appear little in comparison of others. I excuse them, and even figure them to myself as perfections. Every idea I had of others and of myself was false. I loved reading to such excess, particularly romances, that I spent whole days and nights at them. Sometimes the day broke while I continued to read, in so much that for a length of time I almost lost the habit of sleeping. I was ever eager to get to the end of the book, in hopes of finding something to satisfy a certain craving which I found within me. My thirst for eating was only increased the more I read. Books are strange inventions to destroy youth. If they cause no other hurt than the loss of precious time, is not that too much? I was not restrained, but rather encouraged to read them under this fallacious pretext that they taught one to speak well. Meanwhile, through thy abundant mercy of my God, thou camest to seek me from time to time. Thou didst indeed knock at the door of my heart. I was often penetrated with the most lively sorrow and shed abundance of tears. I was afflicted to find my state so different from what it was when I enjoyed thy sacred presence, but my tears were fruitless, and my grief in vain. I could not of myself get out of this wretched state. I wished some hand, as charitable as powerful, would extricate me, as for myself I had no power. If I had had any friend who would have examined the cause of this evil and made me have recourse again to prayer, while which was the only means of relief, all would have been well. I was like the prophet in a deep abyss of mire, which I could not get out of it. I met with reprimands for being in it, but none were kind enough to reach out to free me. And when I tried vain efforts to get out, I only sank the deeper, and each fruitless attempt only made me see my own impotence and render me more afflicted. Oh, how much compassion has this sad experience given me for sinners! It has taught me why so few of them emerge from the miserable state in which they have fallen. Such a seed only cry out against their disorders and frighten them with threats of future punishment. These cries and threats at first make some impression, and they use some weak efforts after liberty. But after having experienced their insufficiency, they gradually abate in their design 
and lose their courage for trying any more. All that man can say to them afterward is but lost labor, though one preached to them incessantly. When any for relief run to confess, the only true remedy for them is prayer, to present themselves before God as criminals, beg strength of Him to rise out of this state, then would they soon be changed and brought out of the mire and clay. But the devil has falsely persuaded the doctors and the wise men of the age that in order to pray it is necessary first to be perfectly converted. Hence people are dissuaded from it, and hence there is rarely any conversion that is durable. The devil is outrageous only against prayer and those that exercise it, because he knows it is the true means of taking his prey from him. He let us undergo all the austerities we will. He neither persecutes those that enjoy them nor those that practice them, no sooner does one enter into a spiritual life, a life of prayer, but they must prepare for strange crosses. All manner of persecutions and contempts in this world are reserved for that life. Miserable as the condition was to which I was reduced by my infidelities and the little help I had from my confessor, I did not fail to say my vocal prayers every day, to confess pretty often, and to partake of the communion almost every fortnight. Sometimes I went to church to weep and to pray to the Blessed Virgin to obtain my conversion. I loved to hear anyone speak of God. I would never tire of the conversation. When my father spoke of him, I was transported with joy, and when he and my mother went on any pilgrimage and were to set off early in the morning, I either did not go to bed the night before or hire the girls to awake me early. My father's conversation at such times was always of divine matters which afforded me the highest delight, and I preferred that subject to any other. I also loved the poor and was charitable even while I was so very faulty. How strange may this seem to some, and how hard to reconcile things so very opposite. End of chapter 5, volume 1 Volume 1, Chapter 6 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 6. Afterward, we came to Paris, where my vanity increased. No course was spared to make me appear to advantage. I was forward enough to show myself and expose my pride in making a parade of this vain beauty. I wanted to be loved of everyone and to love none. Several apparently advantageous offers of marriage were made for me. But God, unwilling to have me lost, did not permit matters to succeed. My father still found difficulties, which my all wiser creator raised for my salvation. Had I married any of these persons, 
I should have been much exposed, and my vanity would have had means to extend itself. There was one person who had asked for me in marriage for several years. My father, for family reasons, had always refused him. His manners were opposite to my vanity. A fear lest I should leave my country together with the affluent circumstances of this gentleman induced my uh, father, in spite of both his own and my mother's reluctance, to promise me to him. This was done without consulting me. They made me sign the marriage articles without letting me know what they were. I was well pleased with the thoughts of marriage, flattering myself with the hope of being thereby set at full liberty and delivered from the ill-treatment of my mother which I drew upon myself. God ordered it far otherwise. The condition which I found myself in afterward frustrated my hopes. Pleasing as marriage was to my thoughts, I was all the time, after my being promised, and even long after my marriage, in extreme confusion, which arose from two causes. First, my natural modesty, which I did not lose. I had much reserve toward men. The other, my vanity. Though the husband provided was a more advantageous match than I merited. Yet I did not think him such. The figure which the others made, who had offered to me before, was vastly more engaging. They rang, who had placed me in view. Whatever did not flatter my vanity was to me insupportable. Yet, this very vanity was, I think, of some advantage. It hindered me from falling into such things as cause the ruin of families. I will not do anything which in the eye of the world might render me culpable. As I was modest at church and had not been used to go abroad without my mother, as the reputation of our house was great, I passed for virtues. I did not see my spouse-elect at Paris till two or three days before our marriage. I caused masses to be said all the time after my being contracted to know the will of God. I wished to do it in this affair at least. O oh my God, how great was thy goodness! to bear with me at this time, and to allow me to pray to thee with as much boldness as if I had been one of thy friends, I, who had rebelled against thee as thy greatest enemy. The joy of our nuptials was universal through our village. Amid this general rejoicing, there appear none sad, but myself. I could neither laugh as others did, nor even eat. So much was I depressed. I knew not the cause. It was a foretaste which God gave me of what was to befall me. The remembrance of the desire I had of being a nun came pouring ill. All who came to compliment me the day after could not forbear rallying me. I wept bitterly. I answered, Alas, I had desired so much to be a nun. When then am I now married? By what fatality has such a revolution befallen me? No sooner was I at the house of my new spouse than I perceived 
that it will be for me a house of mourning. I was obliged to change my conduct. The manner of living was very different from that in my father's house. My mother-in-law, who had long been a widow, regarded nothing else but economy. At my father's house, they lived in a noble manner and great elegance. What my husband and mother-in-law called pride and I called politeness was observed there. I was very much surprised at this change and so much the more as my vanity wished to increase rather than to be diminished. At the time of my marriage, I was a little past fifteen years of age. My surprise increased greatly when I saw I must lose what I had acquired with so much application. At my father's house, we were obliged to behave in a genteel way and to speak with propriety. All that I said was applauded. Here they never hearkened to me, but to contradict and find fault. If I spoke well, they said it was to give them a lesson. If any questions were started at my father's, he encouraged me to speak freely. Here, if I spoke my sentiments, they said it was to enter into a dispute. They put me to silence in an abrupt and shameful manner and scolded me from morning till night. I should have some difficulty to give you an account which cannot be done without wounding charity if you had not forbidden me to omit anyone. I request you not look at things on the side of the creature which would make these persons appear worse than they were. My mother-in-law had virtue, my husband had religion, and not any vice. It is requisite to look at everything on the side of God. He permitted these things only for my salvation, and because he will not have me lost. I had besides so much pride that had I received any other treatment, I should have continued the reign and should not perhaps have turned to God as I was induced to do by the oppression of a multitude of crosses. My mother-in-law conceived such a desire to oppose me in everything that, in order to vex me, she made me perform the most humiliating offices. Her disposition was so extraordinary, having never surmounted it in her youth, that she could hardly live with anybody. Saying known that vocal prayers, she did not see this fault, or seeing it, and not drawing from the forces of prayer, she could not get the better of it. It was a pity, for she had both sense and merit. I was made the victim of her humors. All her occupation was to thwart me, and she inspired the same sentiments in her son. They would make persons my inferiors take place above me, my mother, who had a high sense of honor, could not endure that. When she heard it from others, for I told her nothing, she chided me, thinking I did it, because I did not know how to keep my rank and had no spirit. I dare not tell her how it was, but I was almost ready to die with the agonies of grief and continual vexation. What aggravated all was the remembrance of the persons 
who had proposed for me the difference of their dispositions and manners the love they had for me with their agreeableness and politeness all this made my burden intolerable my mother-in-law abraded me in regard to my family and spoke to me incessantly to the disadvantage of my father and mother i never went to see them but i had some bitter speeches to bear on my return my mother complained that i did not come often enough to see her she said i did not love her that i was alienated from my father by being too much attached to my husband what augmented my crosses was that my mother related to my mother-in-law the pains i had caused her from infancy they then reproached me saying i was a chingeling and an evil spirit my husband obliged me to stay all day long in my mother-in-law's room without any liberty of retiring into my own apartment she spoke disadvantageously of me to lessen the affection and esteem which some had entertained for me she gulted me with the grossest affronts before the finest company this did not have the effect she wanted the more patiently they saw me buried the highest esteem they had for me she found the secret of extinguishing by vivacity and rendering me stupid some of my former acquaintances hardly knew me those who had not seen me before said is this the person famed for, for such abundance of wit she can't say two words she is a fine picture i was not yet sixteen years old i was so much intimidated that i dare not go out without my mother-in-law and in her presence i could not speak i knew not what i said so much fear had i to complete my affliction they presented me with a waiting maid who was everything with them she kept me in sight like a governess for the most part i bore with patience these evils which i had no way to avoid but sometimes i let some hasty answer escaped me a course of grievous crosses to me when i went out the footman had orders to give an account of everything i did it was then i began to eat the bread of sorrows and to mingle tears with my drink at the table they always did something which covered me with confusion i could not forbear tears i had no one to confide in who might share my affliction and assist me to bear it when i would impart some hint of it to my mother i drew upon myself new crosses i resolved to have no confidant it was not from any natural cruelty that my husband treated me thus he loved me passionately but he was warm and hasty and my mother-in-law continuously irritated him about me it was in a condition so deplorable O oh my god that i began to perceive the need i had of thy assistance for this situation was perilous for me i met 
with none but admirers abroad, those that flatter me to my hurt. It were to be feared lest at such a tender age, amid all the strange domestic crosses I had to bear, I might be drawn away. But thou, by thy goodness and love, gave it quite another turn. By these redoubled strokes thou didst draw me to thyself, and by thy crosses effected what thy caresses could not effect. Nay, thou madest use of my natural pride to keep me within the limits of my duty. I knew that a woman of honor ought never to give suspicion to her husband. I was so very circumspect that I often carried to excess so far as to refuse my hand to such as in politeness offered me theirs. There happened to me an adventure which, by carrying my prudence too far, might have ruined me, for things were taken contrary to their intent. My husband was sensible both of my innocence and of the falsehood of the insinuations of my mother-in-law. Such weight crosses made me return to God. I began to deplore the sins of my youth. Since my marriage, I had not committed any voluntarily. Yet I still had some sentiments of vanity remaining, which I did not wish. However, my troubles now counterbalanced them. Moreover, many of them appear my just desert, according to the little light I then had. I was not illuminated to penetrate the essence of my vanity. I fixed my thoughts only on its appearance. I tried to amend my life by penance, and by a general confession, the most exact that I have ever yet made. I laid aside the reading of romances, for which I lately had such a fondness. Though some time before my marriage that had been dampened by reading the gospel, I was so much affected therewith and discovered truth therein that put me out of patience with all the other books. Novel appear then to me only full of lies and deceit. I now put away even indifferent books to have none but such as were profitable. I resumed the practice of prayer and endeavored to offend God no more. I felt His love gradually recovering the ascendant in my heart and punishing every other. Yet I had still an intolerable vanity and self-complacency which has been my most grievous and obstinate sin. My crosses redoubled. What rendered them more painful was that my mother-in-law, not content with the bitterest speeches which she uttered against me, both in public and private, would break out in anger about the smallest trifles and scarcely be pacified for a fortnight. I used a part of my time in bewailing myself when I could be alone, and my grief became every day more bitter. Sometimes I could not contain myself when the girls, my domestics, who owned me submission, treated me ill. I did what I could to subdue my temper, which has cost me not a little. Such stunning blows, 
so impaired the vivacity of my nature that I became like a lamp that is shorn. I prayed to our Lord to assist me, and He was my refuge. As my age differed from theirs, for my husband was twenty-two years older than I, I saw well that there was no probability of changing their dispositions, which were fortified with years. I found that whatever I said was offensive, not excepting those things which others would have been pleased with. One day, weighted down with grief and in despair, about six months after I was married, being alone, I was tempted even to cut out my tongue, so I might no longer irritate those who seized every word I uttered with rage and resentment. But thou, O God, didst stop me short and show me my folly. I pray continuously and wished even to become dumb. So simple and ignorant was I. Though I have had my share of crosses, I never found any so difficult to support as that of perpetual contrariety, without relaxation of doing all one can to please, without succeeding, but still offending by the very means designed to oblige. Being kept with such persons in a most severe confinement from morning till night, without ever daring to quit them, is most difficult. I have found that great crosses overwhelm and stifle all anger. Such a continual contrariety irritates and stirs up sourness in the heart. It has such strange effect that it requires the utmost efforts of self-restraint not to break out into vexation and rage. My condition in marriage was rather that of a slave than of a free person. I perceived four months after my marriage that my husband was gouty. This malady caused many crosses within and without. He had the gout twice the first year, six weeks each time. He was so much plagued with it that he came no more out of his room nor out of his bed. He was in bed usually for several months. I carefully attended him, although so very young. I did not fail to exert myself to the utmost in the performance of my duty. Alas, all this did not gain me friendship. I had not the consolation to know whether what I did was agreeable. I denied myself all the most innocent diversions to continue with my husband. I did whatever I thought would please him. Sometimes he quietly suffered me, and then I esteemed myself very happy. At other times I seemed insupportable to him. My particular friend said I was of a fine age indeed to be a nurse of an invalid, and that it was a shameful thing that I did not set more value on my talents. I answered, since I have a husband, I ought to share his painful as well as his pleasing circumstances. Beside this, my mother, instead of pitying me, reprimanded me sharply for my assiduity to my husband. But, oh my God, how different were thy thoughts from theirs! How different that which was without from what passed within. 
my husband had that foible that when anyone said anything to him against me he flew into a rage at once it was the conduct of providence over me for he was a man of reason and loved me much when i was sick he was inconsolable i believe had it not been for my mother-in-law and the girl i have spoken of i should have been very happy with him most men have their moods and emotions and it is the duty of a reasonable woman to bear them peaceably without irritating them more by cross replies these things thou hast ordered o my god in such a manner by thy goodness that i have since seen it was necessary to make me die to my vain and haughty nature i should not have power to destroy it myself if thou hast not accomplished it by an all-wise economy of thy providence i prayed for patience with great earnestness nevertheless some sallies of my natural liveliness escaped me and vanquished the resolutions i had taken of being silent this was doubtless permitted that my self-love might not be nourished by my patience even a moment's sleep caused me months of humiliation reproach and sorrow and proved the occasion of new crosses End of chapter 6, volume 1Volume 1, Chapter 7 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. Volume 1, Chapter 7 During the first year I was still vain. I sometimes lied to excuse myself to my husband and mother-in-law. I stood strangely in awe of them. Sometimes I fell into a temper. Their conduct appeared so very unreasonable, and especially they countenancing the most provoking treatment of the girl who served me as to my mother-in-law her age and rank rendered her conduct more tolerable but thou o oh my god opened my eyes to see things in a very different light i found in thee reasons for suffering which I had never found in the creature. I afterward saw clearly and reflected with joy that this conduct, as reasonable as it seemed and as mortifying as it was, was quite necessary for me. Had I been applauded here as I was at my father's, I should have grown intolerably proud i had a fault common to most of our sex i could not bear a beautiful woman praised without finding fault to lessen the good which was said of her this fault continued long and was the fruit of cross and malignant pride extravagantly extolling any one proceeds from a like source just before the birth of my first child they were induced to take great care of me my crosses were somehow mitigated indeed i was so ill that it was enough to excite the compassion of the most indifferent they had so great a desire of having children 
to inherit their fortunes, that they were continually afraid, lest I should any way hurt myself. Yet, when the time of my delivery drew near, this care and tenderness of me abated. Once, as my mother-in-law had treated me in a very grating manner, I had the malice to feign a colic, to give them some alarm. But as I saw this little artifice gave them too much pain, I told them I was better. No creature could be more heavily laden with sickness than I was. Besides continual heavings, I had so strange a distaste, except for some fruit, that I could not bear the sight of food. I had continual soonings and violent pains. After my delivery, I continued weak a long time. There was indeed sufficient to exercise patience, and I was enabled to offer up my sufferings to our Lord. I took a favor which rendered me so weak that after several weeks I could scarcely bear to be moved or to have my bed made. When I began to recover, an abscess fell upon my breast, which was forced to be let open in two places, which gave me great pain. Yet all the maladies seemed to me only a shadow of troubles in comparison with those I suffer in the family, which daily increased. Indeed, life was so wearisome to me that some maladies which were thought mortal, did not frighten me. The event improved my appearance and consequently served to increase my vanity. I was glad to call forth expressions of regard. I went to the public promenades, though but seldom, and when in the streets I pulled off my mask out of vanity. I drew off my gloves to show my hands. Could there be greater folly? After falling into these weaknesses, I used to weep bitterly at home. Yet, when occasion offered, I fell into them again. My husband lost considerably this cost me strange crosses, not that I care for the losses, but I seem to be the bad of all the ill humors of the family. With what pleasure did I sacrifice temporal blessings? How often I felt willing to have begged my bread, if God had so ordered it. But my mother-in-law was inconsolable. She bid me pray to God for these things. To me, that was wholly impossible. O oh, my dearest Lord, never could I pray to Thee about the word or the things thereof, nor sally my sacred addresses to Thy Majesty with the dirt of the earth. No. I rather wish to renounce it all, and everything beside whatsoever, for the sake of thy love, and the enjoyment of thy presence in that kingdom, which is not of this world. I wholly sacrificed myself to thee, even earnestly begging thee, rather to reduce our family to beggary, than suffer it to offend thee. In my own mind, I excused my mother-in-law, saying to myself, If I had taken the pains to scrape and save, I would not be so indifferent at seeing so much lost. I enjoy what cost me nothing, and reap 
what I have not sought. Yet all these thoughts could not make me sensible to our losses. I even formed agreeable ideas of our going to the hospital. No state appeared to me so poor and miserable, which I should not have thought easy in comparison with the continual domestic persecutions I underwear. My father, who loved me tenderly, and whom I honor beyond expression, knew nothing of it. God so permitted that I should have him also displeased with me for some time. My mother was continually telling him that I was an ungrateful creature, showing no regard for them, but all for my husband's family. Appearances were against me. I did not go to see them as often as I should. They knew not the captivity I was in. What was I obliged to bear in defending them? These complaints of my mother and a trivial affair that fell out lessened a little my father's fond regard for me, but it did not last long. My mother-in-law reproached me, saying, No afflictions befell them till I came into the house. All misfortunes came with me. On the other hand, my mother wanted me to exclaim against my husband, which I could never submit to do. We continued to meet with loss after loss. The king, retrenching a considerable share of our revenues, besides great sums of money which we lost by La Hotel de Belle, I could have no rest or peace in such great afflictions. I had no mortal to console me or to advise me. My sister, who had educated me, had departed this life. She died two months before my marriage. I had no other for a confidant. I declare that I find much repugnance in saying so many things of my mother-in-law. I have no doubt that my own indiscretion, my caprice, and the occasional sallies of a warm temper drew many of the crosses upon me. Although I had what the word calls patience, yet I had neither a relish nor love for the cross. They conduct toward me which appears so unreasonable should not be looked upon with worldly eyes. We should look higher and then we shall see that it was directed by providence for my eternal advantage. I now dressed my hair in the most modest manner, never painted, and to subdue the vanity which still had possession of me, I rarely looked in the glass. My reading was confined to books of devotion, such as Thomas Kemby's and the works of St. Francis de Sales. I read this aloud, for the improvement of the servants while the maid was dressing my hair. I suffered myself to be dressed just as she pleased, which freed me from a great deal of trouble. It took away the occasions wherein my vanity used to be exercised. I knew not how things were, but they always liked me, and thought all well in point of dress. If on some particular days I wanted to appear better, it proved worse. The more indifferent I was about dresses, the better I appear. 
how often have I gone to church, not so much to worship God as to be seen. Other women, jealous of me, affirmed that I painted. They told my confessor, which chided me for it, though I assured him I was innocent. I often spoke in my own praise, and sought to raise myself by depreciating others, yet these faults gradually deceased, for I was very sorry afterward for having committed them. I often examined myself very strictly, writing down my faults from week to week and from month to month, to see how much I was improved or reformed. Alas, this labor, though fatiguing, was of but little service, because I trusted in my own efforts. I wished, indeed, to be reformed, but my good desires were weak and languid. At one time my husband's absence was so long, and in the meantime my crosses and vexations at home so great that I determined to go to him. My mother-in-law strongly opposed it. This, once my father interfering and insisting on it, she let me go. On my arrival, I found he had almost died. Through vexation and fretting, he was very much changed. He could not finish his affairs, having no liberty in attending to them, keeping himself concealed at the Hotel de Longeville, where Madame de Longeville was extremely kind to me. I came publicly, and he was in great fear lest I should make him known. In a rage, he bid me return home. Love and my long absence from him, surmounting every other reason, he soon relented and suffered me to stay with him. He kept me eight days without letting me steer out of his sight. Fearing the effects of such a close confinement on my constitution, he desired me to go and take a walk in the garden. There I met Madame de Longeville, who testified great joy on seeing me. I cannot express all the kindness I met with in this house. All the domestics served me with emulation and applauded me on account of my appearance and exterior deportment. Yet I was much on my guard against too much attention. I never enter into discourse with any man when alone. I admitted none into my coach, not even my relations, unless my husband were in it. There was not any rule of discretion which I did not duly observe to avoid giving suspicion to my husband or subject of calumny to others. Everyone studied there how to contribute, to divert or oblige me. Outwardly everything appeared agreeable. Chakrin had so overcome and ruffled my husband that I had continually something to bear. Sometimes he threatened to throw the supper out of the windows. I said she would then do me an injury, as I had a keen appetite. I made him laugh, and I laughed with him. Before that, melancholy prevailed 
over all my endeavors and over the love he had for me. God both armed me with patience and gave me the grace to return him no answer. The devil, who attempted to draw me into some offense, was forced to retire in confusion through the signal assistance of that grace. I loved my God and was unwilling to displease Him, and I was inwardly grieved on account of that vanity, which still I found myself unable to eradicate. Inward distresses, together with oppressive crosses, which I had daily to encounter, at length drew me into sickness. As I was unwilling to incommode the Hotel de Longeville, had myself moved to another house. The disease proved violent and tissues, insomuch that the physicians despaired of my life. The priest, a pious man, seemed fully satisfied with the state of my mind. He said, I should die like a saint. But my sins were too present and too painful to my heart to have such presumption. At midnight, they administered the sacrament to me as they hourly expected my departure. It was a sense of general distress in the family and among all who knew me. There were none indifferent to my death but myself. I beheld it without fear and was insensible to its approach. It was father otherwise with my husband. He was inconsolable when he saw there was no hope. I no sooner began to recover than, notwithstanding all his love, his usual faithfulness returned. I recovered almost miraculously, and to me this disorder proved a great blessing. Beside a very great patience under violent pains, it served to instruct me much in my view of the emptiness of all worldly things. It detached me from myself and gave me new courage to suffer better than I had done. The love of God gathered strength in my heart with a desire to please and be faithful to Him in my condition. I reaped several other advantages from it which I need not relate. I had yet six months to drag along with a slow favor. It was thought that it would terminate in death. Thy time, O oh my God, had not yet arrived for taking me to Thyself. Thy designs over me were widely different from the expectations of those about me, it being Thy determination to make me both the object of thy mercy and the victim of thy justice. End of chapter 7 of volume 1all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 8. After long languishing, at length I regained my former health. 
About this time my dear mother departed this life in great tranquility of mind. Beside her other good qualities, she had been particularly charitable to the poor. This virtue, so acceptable to God, he was graciously pleased to commence rewarding even in this life. Though she was but twenty-four hours sick, she was made perfectly easy about everything that was near and dear to her in the world. I now applied myself to my duties, never failing to practice that of prayer twice a day. I watched over myself to subdue my spirit continually. I went to visit the poor in their houses, assisting them in their distresses. I did, according to my understanding, all the good I knew. Thou, O my God, increased both my love and my patience in proportion to my sufferings. I regret not the temporal advantages with which my mother distinguished my brother above me. Yet they fell on me about that as about everything else. I also had for some time a severe ague. I did not indeed serve thee yet with that fervor which thou didst give me soon after. For I would still have been glad to reconcile thy love with the love of myself and of the creature. Unhappily, I always found some who loved me and whom I could not forbear wishing to please. It was not that I loved them, but it was for the love that I bore to myself. A lady, an exile, came to my father's house. He offered her an apartment which she accepted, and she stayed a long time. She was one of true piety and inward devotion. She had a great esteem for me because I desired to love God. She remarked that I had the virtues of an active and bustling life. But I had not yet attained the simplicity of prayer which she experienced. Sometimes she dropped a word to me on that subject. As my time had not yet come, I did not understand her. Her example instructed me more than her words. I observed on her countenance something which marked a great enjoyment of the presence of God. By the exertion of study, reflection, and thoughts, I tried to attain it, but to little purpose. I wanted to have, by my own efforts, what I could not acquire except by ceasing from all efforts. My father's nephew, of whom I have made mention before, was returned from Cochin, China, to take over some priests from Europe. I was exceedingly glad to see him and remember what good he had done me. The lady mentioned was no less rejoiced than I. They understood each other immediately and conversed in a spiritual language. The virtue of this excellent relation charmed me. I admire his continual prayer without being able to comprehend it. I endeavored to meditate and to think on God without intermission, to utter prayers 
and ejaculations. I could not acquire by all my toil what God at length gave me himself, and which is experienced only in simplicity. My cousin did all he could to attach me more strongly to God. He conceived great affection for me. The purity he observed in me from the corruptions of the age, the abhorrence of sin at a time of life when others are beginning to relish the pleasures of it. I was not yet eighteen, gave him a great tenderness for me. I complained to him of my faults ingenuously. This I saw clearly. He cheered me and exhorted me to support myself and to persevere in my good endeavors. He would fain have introduced me into a more simple manner of prayer, but I was not yet ready for it. I believe his prayers were more effectual than his words. No sooner was he gone out of my father's house than thou, O divine love, manifested thy favor. The desire I had to please thee, the tears I shed, the manifold pains I underwent, the labors I sustained, and the little fruit I reaped from them, moved thee with compassion. This was the state of my soul, when thy goodness, surpassing all my vileness and infidelities, and abounding in proportion to my wretchedness, granted me, in a moment, what all my efforts could never procure. Beholding me rowing with laborious toil, the breath of thy divine operations turned in my favor and carried me full sail over this sea of affliction. I had often spoken to my confessor about the great anxiety it gave me to find I could not meditate nor exert my imagination in order to pray. Subjects of prayer which were too extensive were useless to me. Those which were short and pithy suited me better. At length God permitted a very religious person of the order of St. Francis to pass by my father's dwelling. He had intended going another way that was shorter, but a secret power changed his design. He saw there was something for him to do and imagined that God had called him for the conversion of a man of some distinction in that country. His labors there proved fruitless. It was the conquest of my soul which was designed. As soon as he arrived, he came to see my father, who rejoiced at his coming. At this time I was about to be delivered of my second son, and my father was dangerously ill, expected to die. For some time they concealed his sickness from me. An indistinct person abruptly told me. Instantly I arose, weak as I was, and went to see him. A dangerous illness came upon me. My father was recovered, but not entirely, enough to give me new marks of his affection. I told him 
of the strong desire I had to love God, and my great sorrow at not being able to do it fully. He thought he could not give me a more solid indication of his love than in procuring me an acquaintance with this worthy man. He told me what he knew of him and urged me to go and see him. At first I made a difficulty of doing it, being intent on observing the rules of the strictest prudence. However, my father's repeated request had with me the weight of a positive command. I thought I could not do that amiss, which I only did in obedience to him. I took a kinswoman with me. At first he seemed a little confused, for he was reserved toward women. Being newly come out of a fine year's solitude, being new ill, come out of a five years solitude, he was surprised that I was the first to address him. He spoke not a word for some time. I knew not to what attribute his silence. I did not hesitate to speak to him and to tell him a few words. My difficulties about prayer. Presently he replied, It is, madam, because you seek without what you have within. Accustom thyself to seek God in your heart, and you will there find him. Having said these words, he left me. They were to me like the stroke of a dart, which penetrated through my heart. I felt a very deep wound, a wound so delightful that I desire not to be cured. These words brought into my heart what I had been seeking so many years. Rather, they discovered to me what was there and which I had not enjoyed for want of knowing it. O oh my Lord, thou wast in my heart, and demanded only a simple turning of my mind inward to make me perceive thy presence. O oh, infinite goodness, how was I running hither and thither to seek thee? My life was a burden to me, although my happiness was within myself. I was poor in riches, and ready to perish with hunger, near a table plentifully spread, and a continual feast. O beauty, ancient and new, why have I known thee so late? Alas, I saw thee where thou wert not, and did not seek thee where thy word. It was for want of understanding these words of thy gospel. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. The kingdom of God is within you. This I now experience. Thou becamest my king and my heart thy kingdom, wherein thou didst reign supreme and perform all thy sacred will. I told this man that I did not know what he had done to me, that my heart was quite changed, that God was there. He had given me an experience of his presence in my soul not by thought or any application of mind, but as a thing really possessed after the sweetest manner. 
I experienced these words in the canticles, Song of Solomon. Thy name is as precious ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. I felt in my soul an unction which, as a salutary balsam, healed in a moment all my wounds. I slept not that whole night, because thy love, O my God, flowed in me like a delicious oil and burned as a fire which was going to devour all that was left of self. I was suddenly so altered that I was hardly to be known either by myself or others. I found no longer those troublesome faults or reluctances. They disappear, being consumed like chaff in a great fire. I now became desirous that the instrument hereof might become my director, preferable to any other. This good father could not readily resolve to charge himself with my conduct, although he saw so surprising a change effected by the hand of God. Several reasons induced him to excuse himself. First my person, then my youth, for I was only nineteen years. Lastly, a promise he had made to God from a distrust of himself never to take upon himself the direction of any of our sex unless God, by some particular providence, should charge him therewith. However, upon my earnest and repeated request to him to become my director, he said he would pray to God and desire that I should do so. As he was at prayer, it was said to him, Fear not that charge. She is my spouse. When I heard it, it affected me greatly. What, said I to myself, a frightful monster of iniquity, who has done so much to offend my God, in abusing his favors and requiting them with ingratitude, now to be declared his spouse. After this he consented to my request. Nothing was more easy to me than prayer. Hours passed away like moments, while I could hardly do anything else but pray. The fervency of my love allowed me no intermission. It was a prayer of rejoicing and possessing, devoid of all busy imaginations and forced reflections. It was a prayer of the will and not of the head. The taste of God was so great, so pure, unblended, and uninterrupted that it drew and absorbed the power of my soul into a profound recollection without act or discourse. I had now no sight but of Jesus Christ alone. All else was excluded. In order to love with the greater extent, without any selfish motives or reasons for loving, the will absorbed the two others, the memory and understanding into itself, and concentrated them in love, not but that they still subsisted, but the operations were in a manner imperceptible and passive. They were no longer stopped or retarded by the multiplicity but collected and united in one. So the rising of the sun does not extinguish the stars, but overpowers and absorbs them in the luster of this incomparable 
glory. End of chapter 8 of volume 1This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 9. Such was the prayer that was given me at once far above ecstasies, transports, or visions. All these gifts are less pure and more subject to illusion or deceits from the enemy. Visions are in the inferior powers of the soul and cannot produce true union. The soul must not dwell or rely upon them or be retarded by them. They are but favors and gifts. The giver alone must be our object and aim. It is of such that Paul speaks. Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. Second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 18 which is generally the case with such as are fond of visions, and lay a stress on them, because they are apt to convey a vanity to the soul, or at least hinder it from humbly attending to God only. Ecstasies arise from a sensible relish. They may be termed a kind of spiritual sensuality, wherein the soul, letting itself go too far by reason of the sweetness it finds in them, falls imperceptibly into decay. The crafty enemy presents such sort of interior elevations and raptures for baits to entrap the soul, to fill it with vanity and self-love, to fix its esteem and attention on the gifts of God and to hinder it from following Jesus Christ in the way of renunciation and of death to all things. And as to distinct interior words, they too are subject to illusion. The enemy can form and counterfeit them. Or if they come from a good angel, for God himself never speaks that. We may mistake and misapprehend them. They are spoken in a divine manner, but we construe them in a human and carnal manner. But the immediate word of God has neither tone nor articulation. It is mute, silent, and unutterable. It is Jesus Christ himself, the real and essential word, who in the center of the soul that is disposed for receiving him, never one moment ceases from his living, fruitful, and divine operation. O oh, thou word made flesh, whose silence is inexpressible, eloquence, thou canst never be misapprehended or mistaken. Thou becomes the life of our life and the soul of our soul. How infinitely is thy language elevated above all the utterances of human and finite articulation. Thy adorable power, all efficacious, in the soul that has received it, communicates itself through them to others. As a divine seed, it becomes fruitful to eternal life. The revelations of things to come, 
are also very dangerous. The devil can counterfeit them, as he did formerly in the heathen temples where he uttered oracles. Frequently they raise false ideas, vain hopes, and frivolous expectations. They take up the mind with future events, hinder it from dying to self, and prevent it following Jesus Christ in his poverty, abnegation, and death. Widely different is the revelation of Jesus Christ made to the soul when the eternal word is communicated. Galatians chapter 1 verse 16 It makes us new creatures, created anew in him. This revelation is what the devil cannot counterfeit. From hence proceeds the only safe transport of ecstasy, which is operated by naked faith alone, and dying even to the gifts of God. As long as the soul continues resting in gifts, it does not fully renounce itself, never passing into God, the soul loses the real enjoyment of the giver by attachments to the gifts. This is truly an unutterable loss. Lest I should let my mind go after these gifts and steal myself from thy love, O my God, thou wast pleased to fix me in a continual adherence to thyself alone. Souls that's directed get the shortest way. They are to expect great sufferings, especially if they are mighty in faith, in mortification and deadness to all but God. A pure and disinterested love and indenseness of mind for the advantagement of their interest alone. These are the dispositions thou didst implant in me, and even a fervent desire of suffering for thee. The cross, which I had hitherto borne only with resignation, was become my delight and the special object of my rejoicing. End of chapter 9, volume 1Volume 1, Chapter 10 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. Volume 1, Chapter 10. I wrote an account of my wonderful change in point of happiness to that good father who had been made the instrument of it. It filled him both with joy and astonishment. O oh my God, what penances did the love of suffering induce me to undergo? I was impelled to deprive myself of the most innocent indulgences. All that could gratify my taste was denied, and I took everything that could mortify and disgust it. My appetite, which had been extremely delicate, was so far conquered that I could scarcely prefer one thing to another. I dressed loathed some sores and wounds, and gave remedies to the sick. When I first engaged in this sort of employment, it was with the greatest difficulty I was able to bear it. As soon as my aversion ceased, and I could stand the most offensive things, other channels of employment were opened to me. For I did nothing of myself, but left myself to be wholly governed by 
my sovereign. When that good father asked me how I loved God, I answered, far more than the most passionate lover his beloved, and that even this comparison was inadequate, since the love of the creature never can attain to this, either in strength or in depth. This love of God occupied my heart so constantly and so strongly that I could think of nothing else. Indeed, I judged nothing else worthy of my thoughts. The good father mentioned was an excellent preacher. He was desired to preach in the parish to which I belonged. When I came, I was so strongly absorbed in God that I could neither open my eyes nor hear anything, he said. I found that thy word, O oh my God, made its own impression on my heart, and there had its effect without the mediation of words or any attention to them. And I have found it so ever since, but after a different manner, according to the different degrees and states I have passed through. So deeply was I settled in the inward spirit of prayer that I could scarce any more pronounce the vocal prayers. The immersion in God absorbed all things therein. Although I tenderly loved certain saints as St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Teresa, yet I could not form to myself images of them, nor invoke any of them out of God. A few weeks after I had received the interior wound of the heart, which had begun my change, the feast of the Blessed Virgin was held in the convent in which was that good father, my director. I went in the morning to get the indulgences and was much surprised when I came there and found that I could not attempt it, though I stayed above five hours in the church. I was penetrated with so lively a dart of pure love that I could not resolve to abridge by indulgences the pain due to my sins. O oh my God, I cried, I am willing to suffer for Thee. I find no other pleasure but in suffering for Thee. Indulgences may be good for those who know not the value of sufferings, who choose not that Thy divine justice should be satisfied, who, having mercenary souls, are not so much afraid of displeasing Thee as of the pains annexed to sin. Yet, fearing I might be mistaken and commit a fault in not getting the indulgences, for I had never heard of anyone being in such a way before, I returned again to try to get them, but in vain. Not knowing what to do, I resigned myself to our Lord. When I returned home, I wrote to the good father that he had made what I had written a part of his sermon, reciting it verbatim as I had written it. I now quitted all company, bade farewell forever to all plays and diversions, dancing, unprofitable walks and parties of pleasure. For two years I had left off dressing my hair. It became me, and my husband approved it. My only pleasure now was to steal some moments to be alone with thee, O thou, 
what my only love. All other pleasure was a pain to me. I lost not thy presence, which was given me by a continual infusion, not as I had imagined by the efforts of the head or by force of thought in meditating on God, but in the will, where I tasted with unutterable sweetness the enjoyment of the beloved object. In a happy experience I knew that the soul was created to enjoy its God. The union of the will subjects the soul to God, conforms me to all his pleasure, causes self-will gradually to die. Lastly, in drawing with it the other powers, by means of the charity with which it is filled, it causes them gradually to be reunited in the center and lost there as to their own nature and operations. This loss is called the annihilation of the powers. Although in themselves they still subsist, yet they seem annihilated to us. In proportion as charity fills and inflames, it becomes so strong as by decrees to surmount all the activities of the will of man, subjecting it to that of God. When the soul is docile and leaves itself to be purified and empty of all that which it has of its own, opposite to the will of God, it finds itself by little and little detached from every emotion of its own and placed in a holy indifference wishing nothing but what God does and wills. This never can be effected by the activity of our own will, even though it were employed in continual acts of resignation. These, though very virtuous, are so far one's own actions and cause the will to subsist in a multiplicity in a kind of separate distinction on dissimilitude from God. When the will of the creature entirely submits to that of the Creator, suffering freely and voluntarily, and yielding only a concurrence to the divine will, which is its absolute submission, suffering in self to be totally surmounted, and destroyed by the operations of love, this absorbs the will into self, consummates in that of God, and purifies it from all narrowness, dissimilitude, and selfishness. The case is the same with the other two powers. By means of charity, the two other theological virtues, faith and hope, are introduced. Faith so strongly seizes on the understanding as to make it decline all reasonings and all particular illuminations and illustrations, however sublime. This sufficiently demonstrates how far visions, revelations, and ecstasies differ from this and hinder the soul from being lost in God. Although by them it appears lost in Him for some transient moments, yet it is not a true loss, since the soul, which is entirely lost in God, no more finds itself again. Faith then makes the soul lose every distinct light in order to place it in its own pure light. The memory, too, finds all its little activities surmounted by decrees and absorbed in hope. Finally, the powers are all concentrated and lost in pure love. It engulfs them into itself by means of their 
suffering the will the will is the sovereign of the powers and charity is the queen of the virtues and unites them all in herself this reunion that's made is called the central union or unity by means of the will and love all are reunited in the center of the soul in god who is our ultimate end according to saint john he who dwelleth in love dwelleth in god for god is love this union of my will to thine o my god and this ineffable presence was so sweet and powerful that i was compelled to yield to its delightful power power which was strict and severe to my minutest faults end of volume one chapter ten the autobiography of madame kion by jean kion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the autobiography of madame kion by jean kion volume one chapter eleven my senses as i have described were continually mortified and under perpetual restraint to conquer them totally it is necessary to deny them the smallest relaxation until the victory is completed we see those who content themselves practicing great outward austerities yet by indulging their senses in what is called innocent and necessary they remain forever unsubdued austerities however severe will not conquer the senses to destroy their power the most effectual means is in general to deny them firmly what will please and to persevere in this until they are reduced to be without desire or repugnance if we attempt during the warfare to grant them any relaxation we act like those who under pretext of strengthening a man who was condemned to be starved to death should give him from time to time a little nourishment it indeed would prolong his torments and postpone his death it is just the same with the death of the senses the powers the understanding and self-will if we do not eradicate every remains of self subsisting in these we support them in a dying life to the end this state and its termination are clearly set forth by paul he speaks of bearing about in the body the dying of the lord jesus christ second corinthians chapter four verse ten but lest we should rest here he fully distinguished this from the state of being dead and having our life hid with christ in god it is only by a total death to self we can be lost in god he who is thus dead has not further need of mortification the very end of mortification is accomplished in him and all is become new it is an unhappy error in those good souls who have arrived at a conquest of the bodily senses through this unremitted and continual mortification that they should still continue attached to the exercise of it they should rather stop their attention thereto and remain in indifference accepting with equality the good as the bad the sweet as the bitter and bend their whole attention 
to a labor of greater importance, namely the mortification of the mind and self-will. They should begin by dropping all the activity of self, which can never be done without the most profound prayer. No more than the death of the senses can be perfected without profound recollection joined to mortification. Indeed, recollection is the chief means whereby we attain to a conquest of the senses. It detaches and separates us from them, and sweetly saps the very cause from whence they derive their influence over us. The more thou didst augment my love and my patience, O my Lord, the less respite had I from the most oppressive crosses, but love rendered them easy to bear. O ye poor souls, who exhaust yourselves with needless vexation, if you will but seek God in your hearts, there will be a speedy end to all your troubles. The increase of crosses would proportionately increase your delight. Love, at the beginning, a thirst for mortification, impelled me to seek and invent various kinds. It is surprising that as soon as the bitterness of any new mode of mortification was exhausted, another kind was pointed to me, and I was inwardly led to pursue it. Divine love so enlightened my heart, and so scrutinized into its secret springs, that the smallest defects became exposed. If I was about to speak, something wrong was instantly pointed to me, and I was compelled to silence. If I kept silence, faults were presently discovered. In every action there was something defective. In my mortifications, my penances, my almsgiving, my retirement, I was faulty. When I walked, I observed there was something wrong. If I spoke any way in my own favor, I saw pride. If I said within myself, Alas, I will speak no more, here was self. If I was cheerful and open, I was condemned. Pure love always found matter for reproof in me, and was jealous that nothing should escape unnoticed. It was not that I was particularly attentive over myself, for it was even with constraint that I could look at all at myself. My attention toward God, by an attachment of my will to His, was without intermission. I waited continually upon Him, and he watched incessantly over me, and he so led me by his providence that I forgot all things. I knew not how to communicate what I felt to anyone. I was so lost to myself that I could scarcely go about self-examination. When I attempted, all ideas of myself immediately disappeared. I found myself occupied with my one object, without distinction of ideas. I was absorbed in peace inexpressible. I saw by the eye of faith that it was God that thus wholly possessed me. But I did not reason at all about it. It must not, however, be supposed that divine love suffered my faults to go unpunished. O Lord, with what rigor dost thou punish the most faithful, the most loving and beloved of thy children? 
I mean not externally, for this will be inadequate to the smallest fault in a soul that God is about to purify radically. The punishments it can inflict on itself are rather gratifications and refreshments than otherwise. Indeed, the manner in which he corrects his chosen must be felt, or it is impossible to conceive how dreadful it is. In my attempt to explain it, I shall be unintelligible except to experienced souls. It is an eternal burning, a secret fire sent from God to purge away the fault, giving extreme pain until this purification is complete. It is like a dislocated joint, which is in incessant torment until the bone is replaced. This pain is so severe that the soul would do anything to satisfy God for the fault, and would rather be torn in pieces than endure the torment. Sometimes the soul flies to others, and opens her state that she may find consolation. Thereby she frustrates God's designs for her. It is of the utmost consequence to know what use to make of the distress. The whole of one's spiritual advancement depends on it. We should, at these seasons of internal anguish, obscurity, and mourning, cooperate with God, endure this consuming torture in its utmost extent, while it continues, without attempting to lessen or increase it, bear it passively, nor seek to satisfy God by anything we can do of ourselves. To continue passive at such a time is extremely difficult and requires great firmness and courage. I knew some who never advanced farther in the spiritual process because they grew impatient and so means of consolation. End of Volume 1, Chapter 11Volume 1, Chapter 12 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 12. The treatment of my husband and mother-in-law, however rigorous and insulting, I now bore silently. I made no replies, and this was not so difficult for me, because the greatness of my interior occupation and what passed within rendered me insensible to all the rest. There were times when I was left to myself, then I could not refrain from tears. I did the lowest offices for them to humble myself. All this did not win their favor. When they were in a rage, although I could not find that I had given them any occasion, yet I did not fail to beg their burden. Even from the girl of whom I have spoken. I had a good deal of pain to surmount myself as to the last. She became the more insolent for it, reproaching me with things which ought to have made her blush and had covered her with shame. As she saw that I contradicted and resisted her no more in anything, she proceeded to treat me worse. 
and when i asked her pardon she triumphed saying i knew very well i was in the right her arrogance rose to the high that i could not have treated the meanest slave one day as she was dressing me she pulled me roughly and spoke to me insolently i said it is not my account that i am willing to answer you for you give me no pain but lest you should act thus before persons to whom it will give offence moreover as i am your mistress god is assuredly offended with you she left me that moment and ran like a mad woman to meet my husband telling him she would stay no longer i treated her so ill that i hate her for the care she took of him in his continual indispositions wanting her not to do any service for him my husband was very hasty so he took fire at these words i finished dressing alone since she had left me i dare not call another girl she will not suffer another girl to come near me i saw my husband coming like a lion he was never in such a rage as this i thought he was going to strike me i awaited the blow with tranquillity he threatened with his uplifted crutch i thought he was going to knock me down holding myself closely united to god i beheld it without pain he did not strike me for he had presence of mind enough to see what indignity it will be in his rage he threw it at me it fell near me but it did not touch me he then discharged himself in a language as if i had been a street beggar or the most infamous of creatures i kept profound silence being recollected in the lord the girl in the meantime came in at the sight of her his rage redoubled i kept near to god as a victim disposed to suffer whatever he would permit my husband ordered me to beg her pardon which i readily did and thereby appeased him i went into my closet where i no sooner was than my divine director impelled me to make this girl a present to recompense her for the cross which she had caused me she was a little astonished but her heart was too hard to be gained i often asked that because she frequently gave me opportunities she had a singular dexterity in attending the sick my husband ailing almost continually would suffer no other person to administer to him he had a very great regard for her she was artful in his presence she affected an extraordinary respect for me when she was not present if i said a word to her though with the greatest mildness and if she heard him coming she cried out with all her might that she was unhappy she acted like one distressed so that without informing himself of the truth he was irritated against me as was also my mother-in-law the violence i did to my proud and hasty nature 
was so great that I could hold out no longer. I was quite spent with it. It seemed sometimes as if I was inwardly rent, and I have often fallen sick with the struggle. She did not forbear exclaiming against me, even before persons of distinction who came to see me. If I was silent, she took offense at that yet more, and said that I despised her. She cried me down and made complaints to everybody. All this redounded to my honor and her own disgrace. My reputation was so well established on account of my exterior modesty, my devotion, and the great acts of charity which I did, that nothing could shake it. Sometimes she ran out into the street, crying out against me. At one time she exclaimed, Am not I very unhappy to have such a mistress? People gather about her to know what I had done to her. And not knowing what to say, she answered that I had not spoken to her all the day. They returned, laughing, and said, She has done you no great harm, then. I am surprised at the blindness of confessors, and at their permitting their penitents to conceal so much of the truth from them. The confessor of this girl made her pass for a saint. This he said in my hearing. I answer nothing, for love will not permit me to speak of my troubles. I should concentrate them all to God by a profound silence. My husband was out of humor with my devotion. What, said he, you love God so much that you love me no longer? So little did he comprehend that the true conjugal love is that which the lord himself forms in the heart that loves him o thou who art pure and holy thou didst imprint in me from the first such a love of chastity that there was nothing in the world which i would not have undergone to possess and preserve it I endeavored to be agreeable to my husband in anything, and to please him in everything he would require of me. God gave me such a purity of soul at that time that I had not so much as a bad thought. Sometimes my husband said to me, One sees plainly that you never lose the presence of God. The word, seeing I quit it, persecuted, and turned me into ridicule. I was its entertainment and the subject of its fables. It could not bear that a woman, scarce twenty years of age, should thus make war against it and overcome. My mother-in-law took part with the word and blamed me for not doing many things that in her heart she would have been highly offended had I done them. I was as one lost and alone. So little communion had I with the creature, farther than necessity required. I seemed to experience literally those words of Paul. I live yet no more I, but Christ lived in me. His operations were so powerful, so sweet, and so secret altogether, that I could not express them. We went into the country on some business. Oh, what unutterable communications did I there experience in retirement! I was insatiable for prayer, 
I arose at four o'clock in the morning to pray. I went very far to the church, which was so situated that the coach could not come to it. There was a steep hill to go down and another to ascend. All that cost me nothing. I had such a longing desire to meet with my God as my only good, who, on his part, was graciously forward to give himself to his poor creature, and for it to do even visible miracles. Such as saw me lead a life so very different from the women of the world, said I was a fool. They attributed to stupidity. Sometimes they said, What can all this mean? Some people think this lady has parts, but nothing of them appears. If I went into company, often I could not speak. So much was I engaged within, so in word with the Lord, as not to attend to anything else. If any near me spoke, I heard nothing. I generally took one with me that this might not appear. I took some work to hide under that appearance the real employ of my heart. When I was alone, the work dropped out of my hand. I wanted to persuade a relation of my husband's to practice prayer. She thought me a fool for depriving myself of all the amusements of the age. But the Lord opened her eyes to make her despise them. I could have wished to teach all the world to love God, and thought it depended only on them to feel what I felt. The Lord made use of my thinking to gain many souls to himself. The good father I have spoken of, who was the instrument of my conversion, made me acquainted with Genevieve Granger, prioress of the Benedictines, one of the greatest servants of God of her time. She proved of very great service to me. My confessor, who had told everyone that I was a saint before, when so full of miseries and so far from the condition to which the Lord in His mercy had now brought me, seeing I placed a confidence in the Father of whom I have spoken, and that I steered in a road which was unknown to Him, declared openly against me. The monks of His order persecuted me much. They even preached publicly against me as a person under a delusion. My husband and mother-in-law, who till now had been indifferent about this confessor, then joined him and ordered me to leave off prayer and the exercise of piety that I could not do. There was carried on a conversation within me, very different from that which passed without. I did what I could to hinder it from appearing, but could not. The presence of so great a master manifested itself, even on my countenance. That pained my husband, he sometimes told me. I did what I could to hinder it from being noticed, but was not able completely to hide it. I was so much inwardly occupied that I knew not what I ate. I made as if I ate some kinds of meat, though I did not take any. This deep inward attention suffered me scarcely to hear or see anything. I still continue to use many severe 
mortifications and austerities. They did not in the least diminish the freshness of my countenance. I have often grievous fits of sickness and no consolation in life except in the practice of prayer and in seeing Mother Granger. How dear did this cost me, especially the former? Is this esteeming the cross as I ought? Should I not rather say that prayer to me was recompensed with the cross and the cross with prayer? Inseparable gifts united in my heart and life. When your eternal light arose in my soul, how perfectly it reconciled me and made you the object of my love. From the moment I received thee, I have never been free from the cross, nor it seems without prayer, though for a long time I thought myself deprived thereof, which exceedingly augmented my afflictions. My confessor at first exerted his efforts to hinder me from practicing prayer and from seeing Mother Granger. He violently stirred up my husband and mother-in-law to hinder me from praying. The method they took was to watch me from morning until night. I dare not go out from my mother-in-law's room or from my husband's bedside. Sometimes I carried my work to the window under a pretense of seeing better in order to relieve myself with some moment's repose. They came to watch me very closely to see if I did not pray instead of working. When my husband and mother-in-law played cards, if I did turn toward the fire, they watched to see if I continue my work or shut my eyes. If they observed I closed them, they would be in a fury against me for several hours. What is most strange, when my husband went out, having some days of health, he will not allow me to pray in his absence. He marked my work, and sometimes, after he has just gone out, returning immediately, if he found me in prayer, he would be in a rage. In vain, I said, surely, sir, what matters what I do when you are absent, if I be assiduous in attending you when you are present? That would not satisfy him. He insisted that I should no more pray in his absence than in his presence. I believe there is hardly a torment equal to that of being ardently drawn to retirement and not having it in one's power to be retired. O oh my God, the world they raised to hinder me from loving Thee did but augment my love. While they were striving to prevent my addresses to Thee, Thou drewest me into inexpressible silence. The more they labored to separate me from Thee, the more closely didst thou unite me to thyself. The flame of thy love was kindled, and kept up by everything that was done to extinguish it. Often, through compliance, I played at piquet with my husband. At such times, I was even more interiorly attracted than if I had been at church. I was scarce able to contain the fire which burned in my soul, which had all the fervor of what men call love, but nothing of its impetuosity. The more ardent, the more peaceable it was. This fire gained strength from everything that was done to suppress it, and the spirit of prayer was nourished and increased 
from their contrivances, and endeavors to disallow me any time for practicing it. I loved without considering a motive or reason for loving. Nothing passed in my head but much in the innermost recesses of my soul. I thought not about any recompense, gift or favor, which he could bestow or I receive. The well-beloved was himself the only object which attracted my heart. I could not contemplate his attributes. I knew nothing else but to love and to suffer. Ignorance more truly learned than any science of the doctors, since it taught me so well Jesus Christ crucified and brought me to be in love with his holy cross. I could have wished to die in order to be inseparably united to him who so powerfully attracted my heart. As all this passed in the will, the imagination and the understanding being absorbed in it, I knew not what to say, having never read or heard of such a state as I experienced. I dreaded delusion and feared that all was not right, for before this I had known nothing of the operations of God in souls. I had only read St. Francis de Sales, Thomas a. Kempis, The Spiritual Combat, and the Holy Scriptures. I was quite a stranger to those spiritual books wherein such states are described. Then all those amusements and pleasures that are prized and esteemed appear to me dull and insipid. I wonder how it will be that I had ever enjoyed them. And indeed, since that time, I could never find any satisfaction or enjoyment out of God. I have sometimes been unfaithful enough to find it. I was not astonished that martyrs gave their lives for Jesus Christ. I thought them happy and sighed after the privilege of suffering for Him. I so esteemed the cross that my greatest trouble was the want of suffering as much as my heart thirsted for. This respect and esteem for the cross continually increased. Afterward, I lost the sensible relish and enjoyment, yet the love and esteem no more left me than the cross itself. Indeed, it has ever been my faithful companion, changing and augmenting in proportion to the changes and dispositions of my inward state. O oh, blessed cross, thou hast never quitted me, since I surrender myself to my divine crucified master. I still hope that thou wilt never abandon me. So eager was I for the cross, that I endeavored to make myself feel the utmost rigor of every mortification. This only served to awaken my desire for suffering, and to show me that it is God alone that can prepare and send crosses suitable to a soul that thirst for a following of his sufferings and a conformity to his death. The more my state of prayer augmented, my desire of suffering grew stronger as the full weight of heavy crosses from every side came thundering upon me. The peculiar property of this prayer of the heart is to give a strong faith. Mine was without limits, as was also my resignation to God and my confidence in Him. My love of His will 
and of the order of his providence over me. I was very timorous before, but now fear nothing. It is in such a case that one feels the efficacy of these words. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew chapter 11 verse 30 End of volume 1 chapter 12Volume 1, Chapter 13 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. Volume 1 chapter 13 i had a secret desire given me from that time to be wholly devoted to the disposal of my god let that be what it would i said what couldst thou demand of me that i will not willingly offer thee oh spare me not the cross and humiliations were represented to my mind in the most frightful colors. But this deterred me not. I yielded myself up as willing, and indeed our Lord seemed to accept of my sacrifice, for His divine providence furnished me incessantly with occasions and opportunities for putting it to the test. I had difficulty to say vocal prayers I had been used to repeat. As soon as I opened my lips to pronounce them, the love of God seized me strongly. I was swallowed up in a profound silence and inexpressible peace. I made fresh attempts, but still in vain. I began again and again, but could not go on. I had never before heard of such a state. I knew not what to do. My inability increased because my love to the Lord was growing more strong, more violent, and more overpowering. There was made in me, without the sound of words, a continual prayer. It seemed to me to be the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, a prayer of the word which is made by the Spirit. According to St. Paul, it asks for us that which is good, perfect, and conformable to the will of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 to 2 and the seven my domestic crosses continued i was prevented from seeing or even writing to mother granger my very going to divine service or the sacrament were a source of wayful offences the only amusement i had left me was the visiting and attending the sick poor and performing the lowest offices for them. My prayer time began to be exceedingly distressing. I compelled myself to continue at it, though deprived of all comfort and consolation. When I was not employed therein, I felt an ardent desire and longing for it. I suffer inexpressible anguish in my mind and endeavor with the severest inflictions of corporeal austerities to mitigate and divert it but in vain i found no more that enlivening vigor which had hitherto carried me on with great swiftness 
I seemed to myself to be like those young bribes who find a great deal of difficulty to lay aside their self-love and to follow their husbands to the war. I relapsed into a vain complacence and fondness for myself. My propensity to pride and vanity, which seemed quite dead, while I was so filled with love of God, now showed itself again and gave me severe exercise. This made me lament the exterior beauty of my person and pray to God incessantly that He would remove from me that obstacle and make me ugly. I could even have wished to be deaf, blind, dumb, that nothing might divert me from my love of God. I set out on a journey which we had then to make, and I appeared more than ever like those lamps which emit a glimmering flash when they are just on the point of extinguishing. Alas! How many snares were laid in my way! I met them at every step. I even committed infidelities through unwatchfulness. O oh my Lord, with what rigor didst thou punish them? A useless glance was checked as a sin. How many tears did those inadvertent faults cost me through a weak compliance? and even against my will. Thou knowest that thy rigor exercised after my lips was not the motive of those tears which I shed. With what pleasure would I have suffered the most rigorous severity to have been cured of my infidelity? To what severe chastisement did I not condemn myself? Sometimes thou didst treat me like a father who pities the child and caress it after its involuntary faults. How often didst thou make me sensible of thy love toward me, notwithstanding my blemishes? It was the sweetness of this love after my faults which caused my greatest pain, for the more the amiableness of thy love was extended to me, the more inconsolable I was for having departed ever so little from thee. When I had let some inadvertence escape me, I found thee ready to receive me. I have often cried out, O oh my Lord, is it possible thou canst be so gracious to such an offender and so indulgent to my faults so propitious to one who has wandered astray from thee by vain compliances and an unworthy fondness for frivolous objects yet no sooner do i return that i find thee waiting with open arms ready to receive me. O sinner, sinner, hast thou any reason to complain of God? If there yet remains in thee any justice, confess the truth and admit that it is owing to thyself if thou goest wrong, that in departing from him thou disobeyest his call. When thou returnest he is ready to receive thee and if thou returnest not he makes use of the most engaging motives to win thee yet thou turnest a deaf ear to his voice thou wilt not hear him thou sayest he speaks not to thee though he calls loudly it is therefore only because thou daily rebellest and art growing daily more and more deaf to the voice. 
when I was in Paris, and the clergy saw me so young, they appeared astonished. Those to whom I opened my state told me that I could never enough thank God for the graces conferred on me, that if I knew them, I should be amazed at them, and that if I were not faithful, I should be the most ungrateful of all creatures. Some declare that they never knew any woman whom God held so closely in so great a purity of conscience. I believe what rendered it so was the continual care thou hast over me. O oh my God, making me feel thy presence, even as thou hast promised it to us in thy gospel. If a man love me, my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. John 14, verse 23. The continual exercise of thy presence in me was what preserved me. I became deeply assured of what the prophet had said. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Psalms 127, verse 1. Thou, O my love, Word my faithful keeper, who didst defend my heart against all sorts of enemies, preventing the least faults or correcting them when vivacity had occasioned their being committed. But, alas, when thou didst cease to watch for me, or left me to myself, how weak was I! And how easily did my enemies prevail over me. Let others ascribe their victory to their own fidelity. As for me, I shall never attribute them to anything else than thy parental care. I have too often experienced to my cost what I shall be without thee to presume in the least on my cares of my own. It is to thee, and to thee only, that I owe everything. O oh, my deliverer, and my being indebted to thee, for thee gives me infinite joy. While in Paris I relaxed and did many things which I should not. I knew the extreme fondness which some had for me, and suffer them to express it without checking it as I ought. I fell into other faults too, as having my neck a little to bear, though not near so much as others had. I plainly saw I was too remiss, and that was my torment. I saw all about for him who had secretly inflamed my heart. But, alas, hardly anybody knew him. I cry, O thou best beloved of my soul, hast thou been near me? These disasters had not befallen me. When I say that, I spoke thus to him. It is but to explain myself. In reality, it all passed almost in silence, for I could not speak. My heart had a language which was carried on without the sound of words, understood of him as he understands the language of the word, which speaks incessantly in the innermost recesses of the soul. O oh, sacred language, experience only gives the comprehension of it. Let not anything it a barren language, an effect of the mere imagination. Far different, it is the silent expression of the word in the soul. As he never ceases to speak, 
so he never ceases to operate. If people once came to know the operation of the Lord, in souls wholly resigned to his guiding, it will fill them with reverential admiration and awe. I saw that the purity of my state was like to be sullied by too great a commerce with the creatures, so I made haste to finish what detained me in Paris, in order to return to the country. It is true, O oh my Lord, I felt that Thou hast given me strength enough to avoid the occasions of evil, but when I had so far yielded as to get into them, I found I could not resist the vain compliances and a number of other foibles which they snare me into. The pain which I felt after my faults was inexpressible. It was not an anguish that arose from my distinct idea or conception, from any particular motive or affection, but a kind of devouring fire which ceased not till the fault was consumed and the soul purified. It was a punishment of my soul from the presence of its beloved. I could have no access to him, neither could I have any rest out of him. I knew not what to do. I was like the dove out of the ark which finding no rest for the sole of her foot, was constrained to return to the ark. But finding the window shut, could only fly about. In the meantime, through an infidelity which will ever render me culpable, I strove to find some satisfaction without, but could not. This served to convince me of my folly and of the vanity of those pleasures which are called innocent. When I was prevailed on to taste them, I felt a strong repulse, which, joined with my remorse for the transgression, changed the diversion into torment. O oh, my father, said I, this is not to thee and nothing else beside thee can give solid pleasure. One day, as much through unfaithfulness as complaisance, I went to take a walk at some of the public parks, rather from excess of vanity, to show myself than to take the pleasure of the place. O oh, my Lord, how didst thou make me sensible of this fault? But far from punishing me in letting me partake of the amusement, thou didst it in holding me so close to thyself that I could give no attention to anything but my fault and thy displeasure. After this, I was invited with some other ladies to an entertainment at St. Cloud. Through vanity and weak compliance, I yielded and went. The affair was magnificent. They, though wise in the eye of the world, could relish it. I was filled with bitterness. I could eat nothing. I could enjoy nothing. Oh, what tears! For beyond three months, my beloved, we drew his favoring presence, and I could see nothing but an angry God. I was on this occasion, and in another journey which I took with my husband into Touraine, like those animals destined for laughter. On certain days people adorn them with greens and flowers, and bring in pop into the city before they kill them. This weak beauty on the eve of decline shone forth with new brightness in order to become the sooner extinct. 
I was shortly after afflicted with the small box. One day, as I walked to church, followed by a footman, I was met by a poor man. I went to give him alms. He thanked me, but refused them, and then spoke to me in a wonderful manner of God and of divine things. He displayed to me my whole heart, my love to God, my charity, my too great fondness for my beauty, and all my faults. He told me it was not enough to avoid hell, but that the Lord required of me the utmost purity and high of perfection. My heart assented to his reproofs. I heard him with silence and respect. His words penetrated my very soul. When I arrived at the church, I fainted away. I have never seen the man since. End of chapter 13, volume 1Volume 1, Chapter 14 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. Volume 1. Chapter 14 My husband, enjoying some intermission of his almost continual ailments, had a mind to go to Orleans and then into Touraine. In this journey my vanity made its last blaze. I received abundance of visits and applauses. But how clearly did I see the folly of men who are so taken with vain beauty. I dislike the disposition, yet not that which caused it, though I sometimes ardently desire to be delivered from it. The continual combat of nature and grace cost me no small affliction. Nature was pleased with public a blows, grace, made me dread it. What augmented the temptation was that they esteemed in me virtue, joined with youth and beauty. They did not know that all the virtue is only in God and His protection, and all the weakness in myself. I went in search of confessors, to accuse myself of my falling, and to bewail my backslidings. They were utterly insensible of my pain. They esteemed what God condemned. They treated as a virtue what to me appeared detestable in His sight. Far from measuring my faults by His grace, they only consider what I was, in comparison of what I might have been. Hence, instead of blaming me, they only flatter my pride. They justified me in what incurred his rebuke, or only treated as a slight fault what in me was highly displeasing to him, from whom I had received such signal mercies. The heinousness of sins is not to be measured singly by the nature, but also by the state of the person who commits them. The least unfaithfulness in a spouse is more injurious to her husband than far greater ones in his domestics. I told them all the trouble I had being under for not having entirely covered my neck. 
It was covered much more than was covered by other women of my age. He assured me that I was very modestly dressed. As my husband liked my dress, there could be nothing amiss in it. My inward director taught me quite the contrary. I had not courage enough to follow him, to dress myself differently from others at my age. My vanity furnished me with pretenses seemingly just for following fashions. If pastors knew what hurt they do in humoring female vanity, they would be more severe against it. Had I found but one person honest enough to deal plainly with me, I should not have gone on. But my vanity, siding with the declared opinion of all others, induced me to think them right, and my own scruples mere fancy. We met with accidents in this journey, sufficient to have terrified anyone. Though corrupt nature prevails so far as I have just mentioned, yet my resignation to God was so strong that I passed fearless, even when there was apparently no possibility of escape. At one time we got into a narrow pass, and did not perceive until we were too far advanced to draw back, that the road was undermined by the river Loire, which ran beneath and the banks had fallen in, so that in some places the footmen were obliged to support one side of the carriage. All those around me were terrified to the highest degree, yet God kept me perfectly tranquil. I secretly rejoice at the prospect of losing my life by a singular stroke of his providence. On my return, I went to see Mother Granger, to whom I related how it had been with me while abroad. She strengthened and encouraged me to pursue my first design. She advised me to cover my neck, which I have done ever since, notwithstanding the singularity of it. The Lord, who had so long deferred the chastisement merited by such a series of infidelities, now began to punish me for the abuse of His grace. Sometimes I wished to retire to a convent and thought it lawful. I found wherein I was weak, and that my faults were always of the same nature. I wished to hide myself in some cave, or to be confined in a dreary prison, rather than enjoy a liberty by which I suffer so much. Divine love gently drew me inward, and vanity dragged me outward. My heart was rent asunder by the contest, as I neither gave myself wholly up to the one nor the other. I besought my God to deprive me of power to displease Him, and cried, Art thou not strong enough? wholly to eradicate this unjust duplicity out of my heart. For my vanity broke forth when occasions offer, yet I quickly returned to God. He, instead of repulsing or upbraiding me, often received me with open arms and gave me fresh testimonials of his love. They filled me with the most painful reflections on my offense. Though this wretched vanity 
was still so prevalent, yet my love to God was such that after my wanderings, I would rather have chosen His rod than His caresses. His interests were more dear to me than my own, and I wished He would have done Himself justice upon me. My heart was full of grief and of love. I was stung to the quick for offending him, who showered his grace so profusely upon me, that those who know not God should offend him by sin is not to be wondered at, but that the heart which loved him more than itself and so fully experienced his love should be seduced by propensities which it detests is a cruel martyrdom. When I felt more strongly thy presence and thy love, O Lord, said I, how wonderfully thou bestowest thy favors on such a wretched creature who requites thee only with ingratitude. For if he any one reads this life with attention, he will see on God's part nothing but goodness, mercy, and love. On my part, nothing but weakness, sin, and infidelity. I have nothing to glory in but my infirmities and my unworthiness, since in that everlasting marriage union thou hast made with me. I brought with me nothing but weakness, sin, and misery. How I rejoice to own all to thee, that thou favorest my heart with a sight of the treasures and boundless riches of thy grace and love. Thou hast dealt by me as if a magnificent king should marry a poor slave, forget her slavery, give her all the ornaments which may render her pleasing in his eyes, and freely pardon her all the faults and ill qualities which her ignorance and bad education had given her. This thou hast made my case, my poverty is become my riches, and in the extremity of my weakness I have found my strength. Oh, if any knew with what confusion the indulgence favors of God cover the soul after its faults, such a soul will wish with all its power to satisfy the divine justice. I made verses and little songs to bewail myself. I exercised austerities, but they did not satisfy my heart. They were like those drops of water which only serve to make the fire hotter. When I take a view of God and myself, I am obliged to cry out, Oh, admirable conduct of love! towards an ungrateful wretch, O oh, horrible ingratitude, toward such unparalleled goodness. A great part of my life is only a mixture of such things as might be enough to sing me to the grave between grief and love. End of chapter 14, volume 1. Volume 1, Chapter 15 of the Autobiography of Madame Guion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Guion by Jean Guion. 
Volume 1, Chapter 15 On my arrival at home, I found my husband taken with the gout and his other complaints. My little daughter was ill and liked to die of the small box. My eldest son, too, took it, and it was of so malignant a type that it rendered him as disfigured as before he was beautiful. As soon as I perceived the small box was in the house, I had no doubt but I should take it. Mother Granger advised me to leave if I could. My father offered to take me home with my second son, whom I tenderly loved. My mother-in-law would not suffer it. She persuaded my husband it was useless and sent for a physician, who seconded her in it, saying, I should as readily take it at a distance as here if I were disposed to take it. I may say she proved at that time a second Jephtha, and that she sacrificed us both, though innocently. Had she known what followed, I doubt not, but she would have acted otherwise. All the town steered in this affair. Everyone begged her to send me out of the house and cry out that it was cruel to expose me thus. They set upon me, too, imagining I was unwilling to go. I had not told that she was so averse to it. I had at that time no other disposition than to sacrifice myself to divine providence, though I might have removed, notwithstanding my mother-in-law's resistance, yet I would not without her consent, because it looked to me as if her resistance was an order of heaven. I continued in this spirit of sacrifice to God, waiting from moment to moment in an entire resignation for whatever he should be pleased to ordain. I cannot express what nature suffered. I was like one who sees both certain death and an easy remedy without being able to avoid the former or try the latter. I had no less apprehension for my younger son than for myself. My mother-in-law so excessively doted on the eldest that the rest of us were indifferent to her. Yet I am sure if she had known the younger would have died of the smallpox, she would not have acted as she did. God makes use of creatures and their natural inclinations to accomplish his designs. When I see in the creatures a conduct which appears unreasonable and mortifying, I mount higher and look upon them as instruments both of the mercy and justice of God. His justice is full of mercy. I told my husband that my stomach was sick and that I was taking the small box. He said it was only imagination. I let Mother Granger know the situation I was in. As she had a tender heart, she was affected by the treatment I met with and encouraged me to offer myself up to the Lord. At length, nature, finding there was no resource, consented to the sacrifice which my spirit had already made. The disorder gained ground apace. I was seized with a great shivering, 
and pain both in my head and stomach. They would not yet believe that I was sick. In a few hours it went so far that they thought my life in danger. I was also taken with an inflammation on my lungs, and the remedies for the one disorder were contrary to the other. My mother-in-law's favorite physician was not in town, nor the resident surgeon. Another surgeon said that I must be bled, but my mother-in-law would not suffer it at that time. I was on the point of death for the want of proper assistance. My husband, not being able to see me, left me entirely to his mother. She would not allow my physician but her own to prescribe from me, and yet did not send for him, though he was within a day's journey. In this extremity I opened not my mouth. I looked for life or death from the hand of God, without testifying the least uneasiness. The peace I enjoyed within, on account of that perfect resignation in which God kept me by His grace, was so great that it made me forget myself in the midst of oppressive disorders. The Lord's protection was indeed wonderful. How often have I been reduced to extremity? Yet, He never failed to succor when things appear more desperate. It pleased Him so to order it that the skillful surgeon who had attended me before, passing by our house, inquired after me. They told Him I was extremely ill. He alighted immediately and came to see me. Never was a man more surprised when he saw the condition I was in. The small box which could not come out had fallen on my nose with such force that it was quite black. He thought there had been gone green and that it was going to fall off. My eyes were like two goals, but I was not alarmed. At that time I could have made a sacrifice of all things, and was pleased that God should avenge himself on that face, which had betrayed me into so many infidelities. He also was so affrighted that he went into my mother-in-law's room and told her that it was most shameful to let me die in that manner for want of bleeding. She still opposed it violently, so that in short she told him flatly that she would not suffer it until the physician returned. He flew into such a rage at seeing me thus left without sending for the physician that he reproved my mother-in-law in the severest manner. But it was all in vain. He came up again presently and said, If you choose, I will bleed you and save your life. I held out my arm to him, and though it was extremely swelled, he bled me in an instant. My mother-in-law was in a violent passion. The small box came out immediately. He ordered that they should have me bled again in the evening, but she would not suffer it. Fear of displeasing my mother-in-law and a total resignation of myself into the hands of God, I did not retain him. I am more particular to show how advantageous it is to resign oneself to God without reserve. Though in appearance He leave us for a time to prove and exercise our faith, yet 
he never fail us when our need of him is the more pressing one may say with the scripture it is god who brings down to the gates of death and raised up again the blackness and swelling of my nose went away and i believe had they continued to bleed me i had been pretty easy for want of that i grew worse again the malady fell into my eyes and inflamed them with such severe pain that i thought i should lose them both i had violent pain for three weeks during which time i got little sleep i could not shut my eyes they were so full of the small box nor open them by reason of the pain my throat palate and gums were likewise so filled with the pock that i could not swallow broth or take nourishment without suffering extremely my whole body looked leprous all that saw me said that they had never seen such a shocking spectacle but as to my soul it was kept in a content not to be expressed the hopes of its liberty but the loss of that beauty which had so frequently brought me under bondage rendered me so satisfied and so united to god that i will not have changed my condition for that of the most happy prince in the world everyone thought i would be inconsolable several expressed their sympathy in my bad condition as they judged it i lay still in the secret fruition of a joy unspeakable in this total deprivation of what had been a snare to my pride and to the passions of men i praised god in profound silence none ever heard any complaints from me either of my pains or the loss i sustained the only thing i had said was that i rejoiced at and was exceedingly thankful for the interior liberty i gained thereby and they construed this as a great crime my confessor who had been dissatisfied with me before came to see me he asked me if i was not sorry for having the small box and he now taxed me with pride for my answer my youngest little boy took the distemper the same day with myself and died for want of care this blow indeed struck me to the heart but yet drawing strength from my weakness i offered him up and said to god as job did thou gavest him to me and thou takest him from me blessed be thy holy name the spirit of sacrifice possessed me so strongly that though i loved this child tenderly i never shed a tear at hearing of his death the day he was buried the doctor sent to tell me he had not placed a tombstone upon his grave because my little girl could not survive him two days my eldest son was not yet out of danger so that i saw myself stripped of all my children at once my husband indisposed and myself extremely so the lord did not take my little girl then he prolonged her life some years at last my mother-in-law's physician arrived at a time wherein he could not be of but little service to me when he saw the strange 
inflammation in my eyes, he bled me several times, but it was too late. And those bleedings, which would have been so proper at first, did nothing but waken me now. They could not even bleed me in the condition I was in, but with the greatest difficulty. My arms were so swelled that the surgeon was obliged to push in the lungs to a great depth. Moreover, the bleeding, being out of season, had like to have caused my death. This, I confess, would have been very agreeable to me. I looked upon death as the greatest blessing for me, yet I saw well I had nothing to hope in that sight, and that instead of meeting with so desirable an event, I must prepare myself to support the trials of life. After my eldest son was better, he got up and came into my room. I was surprised at that extraordinary change I saw in him. His face, lately so fair and beautiful, was become like a coarse spot of air, all full of furrows. That gave me the curiosity to view myself. I felt shocked, for I saw that God had ordered the sacrifice in all its reality. Some things fell out by the contrariety of my mother-in-law that caused me severe crosses. They put the finishing stroke to my son's face. However, my heart was firm in God and strengthened itself by the number and greatness of my sufferings. I was as a victim incessantly offered upon the altar to him who first sacrificed himself for love. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. These words I can truly say, O oh my God, have been the delight of my heart and have had the effect on me through my whole life. For I have been continually heaped with thy blessings and thy cross. My principal attraction, besides that of suffering for thee, has been to yield myself up without resistance, interiorly and exteriorly, to all thy divine disposals. These gifts, which I was favored with from the beginning, have continued and increased until now. Thou hast thyself guided my continual crosses, and led me through paths impenetrable to all but thee. They sent me pomatums to recover my complexion and to fill up the hollows of the small box. I had seen wonderful effects from me upon others, and therefore at first had a mind to try them. But jealous of God's work, I will not suffer it. There was a voice in my heart which said, If I would have had thee fair, I would have left thee as thou wert. I was therefore obliged to lay aside every remedy and to go into the air which made the pitying worse, to expose myself in the street when the redness of the small box was at the worst, in order to make my humiliation triumph where I had exalted my pride. My husband kept to his bed almost all the time and made good use of his indisposition only as he now lost that 
which before gave him so much pleasure in viewing me. He grew much more susceptible to impressions which any gave him against me. In consequence of this, the persons who spoke to him to my disadvantage, finding themselves now better hearkened to, spoke more boldly and more frequently. There was only thou, O my God, who changed not for me. Thou didst redouble my interior graces, in proportion as thou didst augment my exterior crosses. End of chapter 15, volume 1. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1. Chapter 16 My maid became every day more haughty, seeing that her scoldings and outcries did not now torment me. She thought if she could hinder me from going to the communion, she would give me the greatest of all vexations. She was not mistaken. O oh, divine spouse of pure souls, since the only satisfaction of my life was to receive and to honor thee, I gave everything of the finest I had to furnish the churches with ornaments and contributed to the utmost extent of my abilities to make them have silver plates and chalices. O oh, my love, I cried, let me be thy victim. Spare nothing to annihilate me. I felt an inexpressible longing to be more reduced and to become, as it were, nothing. This girl then knew my affection for the holy sacrament, where, when I could have liberty for it, I passed several hours on my knees. She took it in her head to watch me daily. When she discovered me going, she ran to tell my mother-in-law and my husband. They needed no more to chagrin them. Their invectives lasted for a whole day. If a word escaped me in my own justification, it was enough to make them say that I was guilty of sacrilege and to raise an outcry against all devotion. If I made them no answer at all, they still heightened their indignation and said the most grating things that they could devise. If I fell sick, which often happened, they took occasion to come to quarrel with me at my bed, saying, My communion and prayers were what made me sick. They spoke as if there had been nothing else could make me ill but my devotion to thee, O oh, my beloved. She told me one day that she was going to write to my director to get him to stop me from going to the communion. When I made no answer, she cried out as loud as she could that I treated her ill and despised her. When I went to prayers, though I had taken care to arrange everything about the house, she ran to tell my husband that I was going and I had left nothing in order. When I returned home, his rage fell on me in all its violence. 
they would hear none of my reasons, but said they were all a pack of lies. My mother-in-law persuaded my husband that I let everything go to wreck. If she did not take the care of things, he would be ruined. He believed it, and I bore all with patience, endeavoring as well as I could to do my duty. What gave most trouble was not knowing what course to take. For when I ordered anything without her, she complained that I showed her no respect, that I did things of my own head, and that they were done always the worse for it. Then she would order them contrary. If I consulted her to know what, or how she would have anything to be done, she said that I compel her to have the care and trouble of everything. I had scarcely any rest but what I found in the love of thy will. O oh my God, and submission to thy orders, however rigorous they might be, they incessantly watched my words and actions to find occasion against me. They chided me all the day long, continually repeating and harping over and over the same things, even before the servants. How often have I made my meals on my tears, which were interpreted as the most criminal in the world. They said I would be damned, as if the tears would open hell for me, which surely they were more likely to extinguish. If I recited anything I had heard, they would render me accountable for the truth of it. If I kept silence, they taxed me with contempt and perverseness. If I knew anything without telling it, that was a crime. If I told it, then they said I had forged it. Sometimes they tormented me for several days successively without giving me any relaxation. The girls said I ought to feign sickness to get a little rest. I made no reply. The love of God so closely possessed me that it would not allow me to seek relief by a single word or even by a look. Sometimes I said in myself, Oh, that I had but any one who could take notice of me or to whom I might unburden myself, what a relief it could be to me. But it was not granted me. Yet, if I happened to be for some days free from the exterior cross, it was a most sensible distress to me, and indeed a punishment more difficult to bear than the severest trials. I then comprehended what St. Teresa says, Let me suffer or die. For this absence of the cross was so grievous to me that I languished with desire for its return. But no sooner was this earnest longing granted and the blessed cross returned again than, strange as it may seem, it appeared so weight and so burdensome as to be almost insupportable. Though I loved my father extremely, and he loved me tenderly, yet I never spoke to him of my sufferings. One of my relations, who loved me very much, perceived the little moderation they used toward me, they spoke very roughly to me before him. He was highly displeased and told my father of it, adding that I would pass for a fool. 
soon after i went to see my father who contrary to his custom sharply reprimanded me for suffering them to treat me in such a manner without saying anything in my own defense i answer if they knew what my husband said to me that was confusion enough for me without my bringing any more of it on myself by replies that if they did not notice it i ought not to cause it to be observed nor expose my husband's weakness that remaining silent stopped all disputes whereas i might cause them to be continued and increased by my replies my father answered that i did well and that i should continue to act as god should inspire me and after that he never spoke to me of it any more they were ever talking to me against my father against my relations and all such as i esteemed most i felt this more keenly than all they could say against myself i could not forbear defending them and therein i did wrong as whatever i said served only to provoke them if any complained of my father or relations they were always in the right if any whom they had disliked before spoke against them they were presently approved it if any showed friendship to me such were not welcome a relation whom i greatly loved for her piety coming to see me they openly bid her be gone they treated her in such a manner as obliged her to go which gave me no small uneasiness when any person of distinction came they would speak against me even to those who knew me not which surprised them but when they saw me they pity me it mattered not what they said against me love would not allow me to justify myself i spoke not to my husband of what either my mother-in-law or the girl did to me except the first year when i was not sufficiently touched with the power of god to suffer my mother-in-law and my husband often quarrel then i was in favor and to me they made their mutual complaints i never told the one what the other had said and though it might have been of service to me humanly speaking to take advantage of such opportunities i never made use of them to complain of either nay on the contrary i did not rest till i had reconciled them i spoke many obliging things of the one to the other which made them friends again i knew by frequent experience that i should pay dear for their reunion scarcely were they reconciled when they joined together against me i was so deeply engaged within as often to forget things without yet not anything which was of consequence my husband was hasty and inattention frequently irritated him i walked into the garden without observing anything when my husband who could not go thither asked me about it i knew not what to say at which he was angry i went thither on purpose to notice everything in order to tell him 
and yet when there i did not think of looking i went ten times one day to see and bring him an account and yet forgot it but when i did remember to look i was much pleased yet it happened i was then asked nothing about them all my crosses to me would have seemed little if i might have had liberty to pray and to be alone to indulge the interior attraction which i felt but i was obliged to continue in their presence with such a subjection as is scarcely conceivable my husband looked at his watch if at any time i had liberty allowed me for prayer to see if i stayed more than half an hour if i exceeded he grew very uneasy sometimes i said grant me one hour to divert and employ myself as i had a mind though he would have granted it to me for other diversions yet for prayer he would not i confess that experience caused me much trouble i have often thereby given occasion for what they made me suffer for oh i not to have looked on my capacity as an effect of the will of God, to content myself and to make it my only desire and prayer. But I often fell back again into the anxiety of wishing to get time for prayer, which was not agreeable to my husband. Those faults were more frequent in the beginning. Afterward, I prayed to God in his own retreat, in the temple of my heart, and I went out no more. End of Volume 1, Chapter 16《The Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 17 we went into the country where i committed many faults i thought i might do it then because my husband diverted himself with building if i stayed from him he was dissatisfied that sometimes happened as he was continually talking with the workmen I set myself in a corner, and there had my work with me, but could scarcely do anything by reason of the force of the attraction which made the work fall out of my hands. I passed whole hours this way without being able either to open my eyes or know what passed, but I had nothing to wish for, nor yet to be afraid of. Everywhere I found my proper sender, because everywhere I found God. My heart could then desire nothing but what it had. This disposition extinguished all its desires, and I sometimes said to myself, what wantest thou? What fearest thou? I was surprised to find upon trial 
that I had nothing to fear. Every place I was in was my proper place. As I had generally no time allowed me for prayer, but with difficulty, and would not be suffered to rise till seven o'clock, I stole up at four, and kneeling in my bed, I wished not to offend my husband, and strove to be punctual and assiduous in everything. But this soon affected my health and injured my eyes, which were still weak. It was but eight months since I had the smallpox. This loss of rest brought a heavy trial upon me. Even my sleeping hours were much broken by the fear of not waking in time. I insensibly dropped asleep at my prayers. In the half hour that I got after dinner, though I felt quite wakeful, the drowsiness overpowered me. I endeavored to remedy this by the severest bodily inflictions, but in vain. As we had not yet built the chapel, and were far from any church, I could not go to prayers or sacrament without the permission of my husband. He was very reluctant to permit me, except on Sundays and holidays. I could not go out in the coach, so that I was obliged to make use of some stratagems and to get service performed very early in the morning, to which, feeble as I was, I made an effort to creep on foot. It was a quarter of a league distant. Really, God wrote wonders for me. Generally, in the mornings, when I went to prayers, my husband did not awake until after I was returned. Often, as I was going out, the weather was so cloudy that the girl I took with me told me that I could not go, or if I did, I should be soaked with the rain. I answered her with my usual confidence. God will assist us. I generally reached the chapel without being wet. While there the rain fell excessively. When I returned it ceased. When I got home it began again with fresh violence. During several years that I have acted this way, I have never been deceived in my confidence. When I was in town, I could find nobody. I was surprised that there came to me priests to ask me if I was willing to receive the communion, and that if I was, they would give it to me. I had no mind to refuse the opportunity which thou thyself offered me, for I had no doubt of its being thee who inspired them to propose it. Before I had contrived to get divine service at the chapel I have mentioned, I have often suddenly awoke with a strong impulse to go to prayers. My maid would say, But, madam, you are going to tire yourself in vain. There will be no service, for that chapel was not yet regularly served. I went full of faith, and at my arrival had found them just ready to begin. If I could particularly enumerate the remarkable providences which were hereupon given in my favor, there will be enough to fill whole volumes. 
when I wanted to hear from or write to Mother Granger, I often felt a strong propensity to go to the door, there to find a messenger with a letter from her. This is only a small instance of this kind of continual providences. She was the only person I could be free to open my heart to when I could get to see her, which was with the greatest difficulty. It was through providential assistance, because prohibited by my confessor and husband, I placed an extreme confidence in Mother Granger. I concealed nothing from her, either of sins or pains. I did not now practice any austerities, but those she was willing to allow me. My interior dispositions I was scarcely able to tell, because I knew not how to explain myself, being very ignorant of those matters, having never read or heard of them. One day, when they thought I was going to see my father, I ran off to Mother Granger. It was discovered and cost me crosses. Their rage against me was so excessive that it would seem incredible. Even my writing to her was extremely difficult. I had the utmost abhorrence of a lie so I forbade the footmen to tell any. When they were met, they were asked whither they were going, and if they had any letters. My mother-in-law set herself in a little passage, through which those who went out must necessarily pass. She asked them whither they were going, and what they carried. Sometimes, going on foot to Benedictines, I caused shoes to be carried, that they might not perceive by the dirty ones that I had been far. I dare not go alone. Those who attended me had orders to tell of every place I went. If they were discovered to fail, they were either corrected or discharged. My husband and mother-in-law were always inveighing against that good woman, though in reality they esteemed her. I sometimes made my own complaints, and she replied, How should you condemn them? when I have been doing all in my power for twenty years to satisfy them without success. For as my mother-in-law had two daughters under her care, she was always finding something to say against everything she did in regard to them. But the most sensible cross to me now was the revolting of my own son, against me. They inspire him with so great a contempt for me that I could not bear to see him without extreme affliction. When I was in my room with some of my friends, they sent him to listen to what we said. As he saw this pleased them, he invented a hundred things to tell them. If I caught him in a lie, as I frequently did, she would upbraid me, saying, My grandmother says you have been a greater liar than I. I answer, Therefore I know the deformity of that vice, and how hard a thing it is to get the better of it, and for this reason I will not have you suffer the like. He spoke to me things very offensive, because he saw the awe I stood in 
of his grandmother and his father, if in their absence I found fault with him for anything. He insultingly upbraided me. He said that now I want to be set up over him because they were not there. All this they approved of. One day he went to see my father and rashly began talking against me to him as he was used to doing to his grandmother. But there he did not meet with the same recompense. It affected my father to tears. Father came to our house to desire he might be corrected for it. They promised it should be done, and yet they never did it. I was grievously afraid of the consequences of so bad an education. I told Mother Granger of it, who said that since I could not remedy it, I must suffer and leave everything to God. This child would be my cross. Another great cross was the difficulty I had in attending my husband. I knew he was displeased when I was not with him, yet when I was with him he never expressed any pleasure. On the contrary, he only rejected with scorn whatever office I performed. He was so difficult with me about everything that I sometimes tremble when I approached him. I could do nothing to his liking, and when I did not attend him, he was angry. He had taken such a dislike to soups that he could not bear the sight of them. Those that offered them had a rough reception. Neither his mother nor any of the domestics would carry them to him. There was none but I who did not refuse that office. I brought them and let his anger pass. Then I tried in some agreeable manner to prevail on him to take them. I said to him, I had rather be reprimanded several times a day than let you suffer by not bringing you what is proper. Sometimes he took, at other times he pushed them back. Where he was in a good humor and I was carrying something agreeable to him, then my mother-in-law would snatch it out of my hands. She would carry it herself. As he thought, I was not so careful and studious to please him, he will fly in a rage against me and express great thankfulness to his mother. I used all my skill and endeavors to gain my mother-in-law's favor by my presence, my services, but could not succeed. How bitter and grievous, O oh my God, will such a life be were it not for thee. Thou hast sweetened and reconciled it to me. I had a few short intervals from this severe and mortifying life. This served only to make the reverses more keen and bitter. End of chapter 17, volume 1The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 18. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. About eighth or ninth months after my recovery from the smallpox, Father Lacombe, passing by our house, 
brought me a letter from Father de la Mode, recommending him to my esteem and expressing the highest friendship for him. I hesitated because I was very loath to make new acquaintances. The fear of offending my brother prevailed. After a short conversation, we both desire and further opportunity. I thought that he either loved God or was disposed to love him, and I wished everybody to love him. God had already made use of me for the conversion of three of his order. The strong desire he had of seeing me again induced him to come to our country house about half a league from the town. A little incident which happened opened a way for me to speak to him. As he was in discourse with my husband, who relished his company, he was taken ill and retired into the garden. My husband bade me go and see what was the matter. He told me he had noticed in my countenance and deep inwardness and presence of God, which had given him a strong desire of seeing me again. God then assist me to open to him the interior path of the soul and convey so much grace to him through this poor channel that he went away changed into quite another man. I preserve an esteem for him, for it appeared to me that he would be devoted to God. But little did I then foresee that I should ever be led to the place where he was to reside. My disposition at this time was a continual prayer, without knowing it to be such. The presence of God was so plentifully given that it seemed to be more in me than my very self. The sensibility thereof was so powerful so penetrating, it seemed to me irresistible. Love took from me all liberty of my own. At other times I was so dry, I felt nothing but the pain of absence, which was the keener to me, as the Divine Presence had before been so sensible. In these alternatives, I forgot all my troubles and pains. It appeared to me as if I had never experienced any. In its absence, it seemed as if it would never return again. I still, though it was through some fault of mine, it was withdrawn, and that rendered me inconsolable. Had I known it had been a state through which it was necessary to pass, I should not have been troubled. My strong love to the will of God would have rendered everything easy to me. The property of this prayer was to give a great love to the order of God with so sublime and perfect a reliance on him as to fear nothing, whether danger, thunders, spirits, or death. It gives a great abstraction from oneself, our own interests and reputation, with an utter disregard to everything of the kind, all being swallowed up in the esteem of the will of God. At home I was accused of everything that was ill done, spoiled or broken. At first I told the truth and said it was not I. They persisted and accused me of lying. I then made no reply. Besides, 
they told all their tales to such as came to the house. But when I was afterward alone with the same persons, I never undeceived them. I often heard such things said of me before my friends as were enough to make them entertain a bad opinion. My heart kept its habitation in the tacit consciousness of my own innocence, not concerning myself whether they thought well or ill of me, excluding all the world, all opinions or censures, out of my view, I minded nothing else but the friendship of God. If, through infidelity, I happened at any time to justify myself, I always failed and drew upon myself new crosses, both within and without. But notwithstanding all this, I was so enamored with it, that the greatest cross of all would have been to be without any. When the cross was taken from me for any short space, it seemed to me that it was because of the bad use I made of it that my unfaithfulness deprived me of so great an advantage. I never knew its value better than its loss. I cried, punish me, anyway, but take not the cross from me. This amiable cross returned to me with so much more weight as my desire was more vehement. I could not reconcile two things. They appeared to me so very opposite to desire the cross with so much ardor, to support it with so much difficulty and pain. God knows well in the admirable economy he observes how to render the crosses more weighty, conformable to the ability of the creature to bear them. Hereby my soul began to be more resigned to comprehend that the state of absence and of wanting what I longed for was in its turn more profitable than that of always abounding. This latter nourished self-love. If God did not act thus, the soul would never die to itself. That principle of self-love is so crafty and dangerous that it cleaves to everything. What gave me most uneasiness in this time of darkness and crucifixion, both within and without, was an inconceivable readiness to be quick and hasty. When any answer a little too lively escaped me, which served not a little to humble me, they said I was fallen into a mortal sin. A conduct no less rigorous than this was quite necessary for me. I was so proud, passionate, and of a humor naturally thwarting, wanting always to carry matters my own way, thinking my own reasons better than those of others. Hast thou, O oh my God, spurred the strokes of thy hammer, I should never have been formed to thy will, to be an instrument for thy use, for I was ridiculously vain. Applause rendered me intolerable. I praised my friends to excess and blamed others without reason. But the more criminal I have been, the more I am indebted to thee, and the less of any good can I attribute to myself. 
how blind are men who attribute to others the holiness that God gives them. I believe, my God, that Thou hast had children who, under Thy grace, own much to their own fidelity. As for me, I owe all to Thee. I glory to confess it. I cannot acknowledge it too much. In acts of charity, I was very assiduous. So great was my tenderness for the poor that I wished to have supplied all their wants. I could not see their necessity without reproaching myself for the plenty I enjoyed. I deprived myself of all I could to help them. The very best at my table was distributed. There were a few of the poor where I lived who did not partake of my liberality. It seemed as if thou hast made me thy only almoner there, for being refused by others, they came to me. I cried, It is thy substance, I am only the steward. I ought to distribute it according to thy will. I found means to relieve them without letting myself be known, because I had one who dispensed my alms privately. When there were families who were ashamed to take it in this way, I sent it to them as if I owned them a debt. I clothed such as were naked, and caused young girls to be taught how to earn their livelihood, especially those who were handsome, to the end that being employed and having whereon to live, they might not be under a temptation to throw themselves away. God made use of me to reclaim several from their disorderly lives. I went to visit the sick, to comfort them, to make their beds. I made ointments, dressed their wounds, buried their dead. I privately furnished tradesmen and mechanics wherewith to keep up their shops. My heart was much open towards my fellow creatures in distress. Few indeed could carry charity much farther than our Lord enabled me to do, according to my state, both while married and since. To purify me the more from the mixture I might make of his gifts with my own self-love, he gave me interior probations which were very heavy. I began to experience an insupportable weight in that very piety which had formerly been so easy and delightful to me. Not that I did not love it extremely, but I found myself defective in that noble practice of it. The more I love it, the more I labor to acquire what I saw failed in. But, alas, I seemed continually to be overcome by that which was the contrary to it. My heart, indeed, was detached from all sensual pleasures. For these several years past, it has seemed to me that my mind is so detached and absent from the body that I do things as if I did them not. If I eat or refresh myself, it is done with such an absence or separation as I wander at with an entire mortification of the keenness of sensation in all the natural functions. End of chapter 18, volume 1.
Volume 1, Chapter 19 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 19. To resume my history, the small box had so much hurt one of my eyes that it was feared I would lose it. The gland at the corner of my eye was injured. An impostume arose from time to time between the nose and the eye, which gave me great pain till it was lanced. It swelled all my head to that degree that I could not bear even a below. The least noise was agony to me, though sometimes they made a great commotion in my chamber, yet this was a precious time to me for two reasons. First, because I was left in bed alone, where I had a sweet retreat without interruption. The other, because it answered the desire I had for suffering, which desire was so great that all the austerities of the body would have been but as a drop of water to quench so great a fire. Indeed, the severities and rigors which I then experienced were extreme, but they did not appease this appetite for the cross. It is thou alone, O crucified Savior, who canst make the cross truly effectual for the death of self. Let others bless themselves in their ease or gaiety, grandeur or pleasures. Poor temporary heavens! For me, my desires were all turned another way. Even to the silent path of suffering for Christ and to be united to Him through the mortification of all that was of nature in me, that my senses, appetites, and will, being dead to this, might wholly live in Him. I obtained leave to go to Paris for the cure of my eye, and yet it was much more through the desire I had to see Monsieur Petrot, a man of profound experience, whom Mother Granger had lately assigned to me for my director. I went to take leave of my father, who embraced me with peculiar tenderness, little thinking then that it will be our last adieu. Paris was a place now no longer to be dreaded as in times past. The throngs only served to draw me into a deep recollection, and the noise of the streets augmented my inward prayer. I saw Monsieur Petrot, who did not prove of that service to me, which he would have been if I had then the power to explain myself though I wished earnestly to hide nothing from him. Yet God held me so closely to him that I could scarcely tell anything at all. As soon as I spoke to him, everything vanished from my mind, so that I could remember nothing but some few faults. 
as I saw him very seldom, and nothing stayed in my recollection, and as I read of nothing any way resembling my case, I knew not how to explain myself. Besides, I desired to make nothing known but the evil which was in me. Therefore, Monsieur Betrot knew me not, even till his death. This was of great utility to me, by taking away every support and making me truly die to myself. I went to pass the ten days from the accession to which and died at an abbey four leagues from Paris, the abbess of which had a particular friendship for me. Here my union with God seemed to be deeper and more continued, becoming always simple, at the same time more close and intimate. One day I awoke suddenly at four o'clock in the morning with a strong impression on my mind that my father was dead. At the same time my soul was in a very great contentment, yet my love for him affected with sorrow and my body with weakness. Under the strokes and daily troubles which befell me, my will was so subservient to thine, O my God, that it appeared absolutely united to thee. There seemed indeed to be no will left in me but thine only. My own disappeared, and no desires, tendencies, or inclinations were left but to the one sole object of whatever was most pleasing to thee, be it what it would. If I had a will, it was in union with thine, as two well tuned lutes in concert. That which is not touched renders the same sound as that which is touched. It is but one and the same sound, one pure harmony. It is this union of the will which establishes in perfect peace. Yet, though my own will was lost, I have found since, in the strange states I have been obliged to pass through, how much it had yet to cost me to have it totally lost. How many souls are there which think their own wills quite lost, while they are yet very far from it? They would find they still subsist if they met with severe trials. Who is there who does not wish something for himself, either of interest, wealth, honor, pleasure, conveniency, and liberty. He who thinks his mind loose from all these objects because he possesses them would soon perceive his attachment to them where he stripped of those he possessed. If there are found in a whole age three persons so dead to everything as to be utterly resigned to providence without any exception, they may well pass for prodigies of grace. In the afternoon, as I was with the abbess, I told her I had strong presentiments of my father's death. Indeed, I could hardly speak. I was so affected within. Presently one came to tell her that she was wanted in the parlor. It was a messenger come in haste with an account from my husband that my father was ill. 
and as I afterward found, he suffered only twelve hours. He was therefore by this time dead. The abbess returning said, Here is a letter from your husband, who writes that your father is taken violently ill. I said to her, He is dead. I cannot have a doubt about it. I sent away to Paris immediately to hire a coach to go the sooner. Mine waited for me at the midway. I went off at nine o'clock at night. They said I was going to destroy myself. I had no acquaintance with me as I had sent away my maid to Paris to put everything in order there. Being in a religious house, I had no mind to keep a footman with me. The abbess told me that since I thought my father was dead, it would be rashness in me to expose myself and run the risk of my life in that manner. Coaches could hardly pass the way I was going, it being no beaten road. I answered, it was my indispensable duty to go to assist my father, and that I owe not on a bare apprehension to exempt myself from it. I then, when alone, abandoned to providence, with people unknown. My weakness was so great that I could hardly keep my seat in the coach. I was often forced to alight on account of dangerous places in the road. In this way I was obliged about midnight to cross a forest notorious for murders and robberies. The most intrepid dreaded, but my resignation left me scarce any room to think at all about it. What fears and uneasiness does a resigned soul spare itself? All alone I arrived within five leagues of my own habitation, where I found my confessor, who had opposed me, with one of my relations waiting for me. The sweet consolation I had enjoyed when alone was now interrupted. My confessor, ignorant of my state, restrained me entirely. My grief was of such a nature that I could not shed a tear, and I was ashamed to hear a thing which I knew but too well, without giving any exterior mark of grief. The inward and profound peace I enjoy down on my countenance. The state I was in did not permit me to speak or to do such things as are usually expected from persons of piety. I could do nothing but love and be silent. I found on my arrival at home that my father was already buried because of the excessive heat. It was ten o'clock at night. All were the hobby of mourning. I had traveled thirty leagues in a day and a night. As I was very weak, not having taken any nourishment, I was instantly put to bed. About two o'clock in the morning, my husband got up, and having gone out of my chamber, he returned presently, crying out with all his might, My daughter is dead. She was my only daughter, as dearly beloved as truly lovely. She had so many graces both of body and mind conferred on her that one must have been insensible not to have loved her. She had an extraordinary share of love to God. Often was she found in corners at prayer. 
as soon as she perceived me at prayer she came and joined if she discovered that i had been without her she would weep bitterly and cry ah mamma you pray but i don't when we were alone and she saw my eyes closed she would whisper are you asleep then she would cry out ah no you are praying to our dear jesus dropping on her knees before me she would begin to pray too she was several times whipped by her grandmother because she said she would never have any other husband but our lord she could never make her say otherwise she was innocent and modest as a little angel very dutiful and endearing and withal very beautiful her father dote on her to me she was very dear much more for the qualities of her mind than those of her beautiful person i looked upon her as my only consolation on earth she had as much affection for me as her brother had aversion and contempt she died of an unseasonable bleeding but what shall i say she died by the hands of him who was pleased for wise reasons of his own to strip me of all there now remained to me only the son of sorrow he fell ill to the point of death but was restored at the prayer of mother granger who was now my only consolation after god i no more wept for my child than for my father i could only say thou o lord gave her to me it pleases thee to take her back again for she was thine as for my father his virtue was so generally known that i must rather be silent than enter upon the subject his reliance on god his faith and patience were wonderful both died in july sixteen seventy two henceforth crosses were not spared me and though i had abundance of them hitherto yet they were only the shadows of those which i have been since obliged to pass through in this spiritual marriage i claim for my dowry only crosses scorches persecutions ignominies loneliness and nothingness of self which in god's great goodness and for wise ends as i have seen has been pleased to grant and confer upon me one day being in great distress on account of the redoubling of outward and inward crosses i went into my closet to give vent to my grief monsieur betrothe was brought into my mind with this wish oh that he was sensible of what i suffer though he wrote but very seldom and with great difficulty yet he wrote me a letter dated the same day about the cross it was the finest and most consolatory he ever wrote me on that subject sometimes my spirit was so oppressed with continual crosses which scarcely gave me any relaxation that when alone my eyes turned every way to see if they could find anything to give relief a word a sigh a trifle or to know that any one took part in my grief would have been some comfort that was not granted me not even to look toward heaven or to make any complaint 
love held me then so closely that it would have this miserable nature to perish without giving it any support or nourishment oh my dearest lord thou yet gavest my soul a victorious support which made it triumph over all the weaknesses of nature and seize thy knife to sacrifice it without sparing and yet this nature so perverse and full of artifices to save its life at last took the course of nourishing itself on its own despair on its fidelity under such heavy a continual oppression it sought to conceal the value it attributed there too but thy eyes were too penetrating not to detect the subtlety wherefore thou o my shepherd changed thy conduct toward it thou sometimes comforted it with thy crook and thy staff that is to say by thy conduct as loving as crucifying but it was only to reduce it to the last extremity as i shall show hereafter End of chapter 19, volume 1The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 20. A lady of rank, whom I sometimes visited, took a particular liking to me, because, as she was pleased to say, my person and manners were agreeable. She said that she observed in me something extraordinary and uncommon. I believe it was the inward attraction of my soul that appeared on my very countenance one day a gentleman of fashion said to my husband's aunt i saw the lady your niece and it is very evident that she lives in the presence of god i was surprised at this as i little thought such an one as he could know what it was to have god thus present this lady of rank began to be touched with the sense of God. Wanting once to take me to the play, I refused to go. I never went to plays, making use of the pretext of my husband's continual indispositions. She pressed me exceedingly and said, I shall not be prevented by his sickness from taking some amusement and I was not of an age to be confined with the sick like a nurse. I told her my reasons. She then perceived that it was more from a principle of piety than the dispositions of my husband. Insisting to know my sentiment of place, I told her, I entirely disapprove of them, and especially for a Christian woman and as she was far more advanced in years than i was what i then said made such an impression on her mind she never went again once with her and another lady who was fond of talking and who had read the fathers they spoke much of god this lady spoke learnedly of him i said scarcely anything be inwardly drawn to silence and trouble at this conversation about god my acquaintance came next day to see me 
the Lord had so touched her heart, she could hold out no longer. I attribute this to something that the other lady had said, but she said to me, Your silence had something in it which penetrated to the bottom of my soul. I could not relish what the other said. We spoke to one another with open hearts. It was then that God left indelible impressions of His grace on her soul, and she continued so athirst for Him that she could scarcely endure to converse on any other subject that she might become wholly his, he deprived her of a most affectionate husband. He visited her with such severe crosses, and at the same time poured his grace so abundantly into her heart, that he soon became the sole master thereof. After the death of her husband, and the loss of most of her fortune, she went to reside four leagues from our house on a small estate which was left. She obtained my husband's consent to my going to spend a week with her to console her. God gave her by my means all she wanted. She had a great share of understanding but was surprised at my expressing things to her so far above my natural capacity. I should have been surprised at it myself. It was God who gave me the gift for her sake, diffusing a float of grace into her soul without regarding the unworthiness of the channel of which she was pleased to make use. Since that time, her soul has been the temple of the Holy Ghost, and our hearts have been indissolubly united. My husband and I took a little journey together in which both my resignation and humility were exercised, yet without difficulty or constraint. So powerful was the influence of divine grace. We had all liked to have perished in a river. The rest of the company, in desperate fright, threw themselves out of the coach, which sank in the moving sand. I continued so much inwardly occupied that I did not once think of the danger. God delivered me from it without my thought of avoiding it. I was quite content to be drowned, had he permitted it. It may be said I was rash. I believe I was so. Yet I rather chose to perish, trusting in God, than make my escape in a dependence on myself. What say I? We do not perish, but for one of trusting Him. My pleasure is to be indebted to Him for everything. This renders me content in my miseries, which I would rather endure all my life long in a state of resignation to Him than put an end to them in a dependence on myself. However, I will not advise others to act thus unless they were in the same disposition which I was in. As my husband's maladies daily increased, he resolved to go to St. Rhin. He appeared very desirous of having none but me with him, and told me one day, If they never spoke to me against you, I should be more easy, and you more happy. In this journey I committed many faults of self-love and self-seeking. I was become like a poor traveler that had lost his way in the night and could find no way, path, or track. My husband, in his return from St. Rhin, 
passed by St. Edom. Having now no children, but my first-born son, who was often at the gates of death, he wished exceedingly for heirs, and prayed for them earnestly. God granted his desire and gave me a second son. As I was several weeks without anyone daring to speak to me on account of my great weakness, it was a time of retreat and of silence. I tried to indemnify myself for the loss of time I had sustained in the others, to pray to Thee, O my God, and to continue alone with Thee. I may say that God took a new possession of me and left me not. It was a time of continual joy without interruption. As I had experienced many inward difficulties and weaknesses, it was a new life. It seemed as if I was already in the fruition of beatitude. How dear did this happy time cost me, since it was only a preparative to a total privation of comfort for several years without any support or hope of return. It began with the death of Mr. Granger, who had been my only consolation under God. Before my return from St. Rand, I heard she was dead. When I received the news, I confess it was the most afflicting stroke I had ever felt. I thought that had I been with her at her death, I might have spoken to her and received her last instructions. God has so ordered it that I was deprived of her assistance in almost all my losses in order to render the strokes more painful. Some months indeed before her death it was shown to me that Though I could not see her, but with difficulty and suffering for it, yet she was still some support to me. The Lord let me know that it will be profitable for me to be deprived of her. But at the time she died, I did not think so. It was in that trying season, when my paths were all blocked up, she was taken from me. She who might have guided me in my lonesome and difficult road, bounded as it were with precipices and entangled with briars and thorns. Adorable conduct of my God! There must be no guide for the person whom thou art leading into the regions of darkness and death, no conductor for the man whom thou art determined to destroy that is, to cause to die totally to himself. After having saved me with much mercy, after having led me by the hand in rugged paths, it seems thou wast bent on my destruction. May it not be said that thou dost not save but to destroy, nor go to seek the lost ship, but to cause it to be yet more lost, that thou art pleased in building what is demolished, and in demolishing what is built. Thou wouldst overturn the temple built by human endeavors with so much care and industry, in order, as it were miraculously, to erect a divine structure, a house not built with hands, eternal in the heavens. Secrets of the incomprehensible wisdom of God, unknown to any besides himself. Man sprang up only of a few days, wants to penetrate and to set bounds to it. Who is it that hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Is it a wisdom only to be known through death to everything, 
and through the entire loss of all self. My brother now openly showed his hatred for me. He married at Orleans, and my husband had the complaisance to go to his marriage. He was in a poor state of health, the roads bad, and so covered over with snow that we had liked to have been overturned twelve or fifteen times. Yet, far from appearing obliged by his politeness, my brother quarreled with him more than ever, and without reason. I was the bad of both their resentments. While I was at Orleans, meeting with one whom at that time I thought highly of, I was too forward and free in speaking to him of spiritual things, thinking I was doing well, but had a remorse for it afterwards. How often we mistake nature for grace. One must be dead to self when such forwardness comes from God only. My brother treated me with the utmost contempt, yet my mind was so full drawn inward that although we had much more danger on the road than when doing, I had no thought about myself but all about my husband. Seeing the coach overturning, I said, Fear not, it is on my side that it falls. It will not hurt you. I believe, had all perished, I should not have been moved. My peace was so profound that nothing could shake it. If this time continued, we should be too strong. They now began to come but seldom, and were followed with long and wearisome privations. Since that time my brother has changed for the better, and has turned on the side of God, but he has never turned to me. It has been by particular permission of God, and the conduct of His providence over my soul, that has caused him and other religious persons who have persecuted me to think they were rendering glory to God and doing acts of justice therein. Indeed, it is just that all creatures should be treacherous to me and declare against me who have too many times been treacherous to God and sided with His enemy. After this, there was a very perplexing affair. To me it caused great crosses, and seemed designed for nothing else. A certain person conceived so much malice against my husband, that he was determined to ruin him, if possible. He found no other way to attempt it, but by entering into a private engagement with my brother, he obtained a power to demand, in the name of the king's brother, two hundred thousand livres, which he pretended that my brother and I owned him. My brother signed the processes upon an assurance given him that he should not pay anything. I think his youth engaged him in what he did not understand. This affair so chagrined my husband that I have reason to believe it shortened his days. He was so angry with me, although I was innocent, that he could not speak to me except in a fury. He would give me no light into the affair, and I did not know in what it consist. In the height of his rage, he said, she will not meddle with it, but give me my portion and let me live as I could. On the other side, my brother will not move in it, nor suffer anything to be done. The day of the trial, after prayer, I felt myself 
strongly pressed to go to the judges. I was wonderfully assisted, even so as to discover and unravel all the turns and artifices of this affair, without knowing how I would have been able to do it. The first judge was so surprised to see the affair so different from what he had thought it before, that he himself exhorted me to go to the other judges, and especially to the intendant, who was just then going to court. He was quite misinformed about the matter. God enabled me to manifest the truth in so clear a light, and gave such power to my words, that the intendant thanked me for having so seasonably come to undeceive and set him right. Had I not done this, he assured me the cause had been lost. As they saw the falsehood of every point, they would have condemned the plaintiff to pay the costs, if he had not been so great a prince who lent his name to the shim. To save the honor of the prince, they order us to pay him fifty crowns. Hereby the two hundred thousand livres were reduced to only one hundred and fifty. My husband was exceedingly pleased at what I had done. My brother appeared as outrageous against me as if I had caused him some great loss. Thus, moderately, and at once ended an affair which had at first appeared so very weighty and alarming. End of chapter 20, volume 1Volume 1, Chapter 21 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. Volume 1, Chapter 21 About this time I fell into a state of total privation, which lasted nearly seven years. I seemed to myself cast down like Nebuchadnezzar to live among beasts. A deplorable state, yet of the greatest advantage to me, by the use which divine wisdom made of it. This state of emptiness, darkness, and impotency went far beyond any trials I had ever yet met. I have since experienced that the prayer of the heart, when it appears most dry and barren, nevertheless is not ineffectual nor offered in vain. God gives what is best for us, though not what we most relish or wish for. Were people but convinced of this truth, they would be far from complaining all their lives. By causing us death, he will procure us life. For all our happiness, spiritual, temporal, and internal, consists in resigning ourselves to God, leaving it to him to do in us and with us as he pleases, and with so much the more submission as things please us less. By this pure dependence on his spirit, everything is given us admirably. Our very weaknesses in his hand prove a source of humiliation. If the soul were faithful, to leave itself in the hand of God, sustaining all his operations, whether gratifying or mortifying, suffering itself to be conducted, 
from moment to moment by his hand and annihilated by the strokes of his providence without complaining or desiring anything but what it has it will soon arrive at the experience of the eternal truth though it might not at once know the ways and methods by which god conducted it there people want to direct god instead of resigning themselves to be directed by him they want to show him a way instead of passively following with that wherein he leads them hence many souls called to enjoy god himself and not barely his gifts spend all their lives in running after little consolations and feeding on them resting there only making all their happiness to consist therein if my chains and my imprisonment in any way afflict you i pray that they may serve to engage you to seek nothing but god for himself alone and never to desire to possess him but by the death of your whole selves never to seek to be something in the ways of the spirit but choose to enter into the most profound nothingness i had an internal strife which continually racked me two powers which appear equally strong seemed equally to struggle for the mastery within me on the one hand a desire of pleasing thee o my god a fear of offending and a continual tendency of all my powers to thee on the other side the view of all my inward corruptions the depravity of my heart and the continual stirring and rising of self what torrents of tears what desolations have this cost me is it possible i cried that i have received so many graces and favors from god only to lose them that i have loved him with so much ardor but to be eternally deprived of him that his benefits have only produced ingratitude his fidelity been repaired with infidelity that my heart has been empty of all creatures and created objects and filled with his blessed presence and love in order now to be wholly void of divine power and only filled with wanderings and created objects i could now no longer pray as formerly heaven seemed shut to me and i thought justly i could get no consolation or make any complaint nor had i any creature on earth to apply to i found myself banished from all beings without finding a support of refuge in anything i could no more practice any virtue with facility alas said i is it possible that this heart formerly all on fire should now become like ice i often thought all creatures combined against me laden with a weight of past sins and a multitude of new ones i could not think god would ever pardon me but looked on myself as a victim designed for hell i would have been glad to do penances to make use of prayers pilgrimages and vows but still whatever i try for a remedy seemed only to increase the malady i may say that tears were my drink and sorrow my food i felt in myself such a pain 
as I never could bring any to comprehend, but such as have experienced it. I had within myself an executioner who tortured me without respite. Even when I went to church, I was not easy there. To sermons I could give no attention. They were now of no service or refreshment to me. I scarcely conceived or understood anything in them or about them. End of chapter 21, volume 1 Volume 1, chapter 22 of the Autobiography of Madame Kion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume 1, Chapter 22. As my husband drew near his end, his distempers had no intermission. No sooner was he recovered from one when he fell into another. He bore great pains with much patience, offering them to God and making a good use of them. Yet his anger toward me increased, because reports and stories of me were multiplied to him, and those about him did nothing but vex him. He was the more susceptible of such impressions as his pains gave him a stronger bent to vexation. At this time the maid, who used to torment me, sometimes took pity on me. She came to see me as soon as I was gone into my closet and said, Come to my master, that your mother-in-law may not speak any more to him against you. I pretended to be ignorant of it all, but he could not conceal his displeasure, nor even suffer me near him. My mother-in-law, at the same time, kept no bounds. All that came to the house were witnesses of the continual scoldings, which I was forced to bear, and which I bore with much patience, notwithstanding my being in the condition I have mentioned. My husband, having sometimes before his death finished the building of the chapel in the country, where we spent a part of the summer, I had the conveniency of hearing prayers every day and of the communion. Not daring to do it openly every day, the priest privately admitted me to the communion. They solemnized the dedication of this little chapel. I felt myself all on a sudden, ill-wardly seized, which continued more than five hours, all the time of the ceremony, when our Lord made a new consecration of me to Himself. I then seemed to myself a temple consecrated to him, both for time and for eternity. I said within myself, speaking both of the one and the other, May this temple never be profaned. May the praises of God be sung therein forever. It seemed to me at that time as if my prayer was granted. But soon all this was taken from me, and not so much as my remembrance left to console me. When I was at this country house, which was only a little place of retreat before the chapel was built, I retired for prayer to woods and caverns. How many times here has God preserved me from dangerous and venomous beasts. 
Sometimes, unawares, I kneel upon serpents, which were there in great plenty. They fled away without doing me any harm. Once I happened to be alone in a little wood, wherein was a mud ball, but he betook himself to flight. If I could recount all the providences of God in my favor, it would appear wonderful. They were indeed so frequent and continual that I could not but be astonished at them. God everlastingly gives to such as have nothing to repay him. If there appears in the creature any fidelity or patience, it is he alone who gives it. If he ceases for an instant to support, if he seems to leave me to myself, I cease to be strong, and find myself weaker than any other creature. If my miseries show what I am, his favors show what he is, and the extreme necessity I am under of ever depending on him. After twelve years and four months of marriage, crosses as great as possible except poverty, which I never knew, though I had much desired it, God drew me out of that state to give me still stronger crosses of such a nature as I had never met with before. For if you give attention, sir, to the life which you have ordered me to write, you will remark that my crosses have been increasing till the present time, one removed to give place to another to succeed it, still heavier than the former. Amid the troubles imposed upon me, when they said I was in a mortal sin, I had nobody in the world to speak to. I could have wished to have had somebody for a witness of my conduct, but I had none. I had no support, no confessor, no director, no friend, no counselor. I had lost all. And after God had taken from me one after another, He withdrew also himself. I remained without any creature, and to complete my distress, I seemed to be left without God, who alone could support me in such a deeply distressing state. My husband's illness grew every day more obstinate. He apprehended the approach of death, and even wished for it, so oppressive was languishing life. To his other ills was great dislike to every sort of nourishment. He did not take anything necessary to sustain life. I alone had the courage to get him to take what little he did. The doctor advised him to go to the country. There, for a few days at first, he seemed to be better, when he was suddenly taken with a complication of diseases. His patience increased his pain. I saw plainly he could not live long. It was a great trouble to me that my mother-in-law kept me from him as much as she could. She infused into his mind such a displeasure against me that I was afraid lest he should die in it. I took a little interval of time when she happened not to be with him, and drawing near his bed, I kneeled down and said to him that if I had ever done anything that displeased him, I begged his pardon, assuring him it has not been voluntary. He appeared very much affected, 
as he had just come out of a sound sleep, he said to me, It is I who beg your pardon. I did not deserve you. After that time, he was not only pleased to see me, but gave me advice what I should do after his death, not to depend on the people on whom now I depended. He was for eight days very resigned and patient. I sent to Paris for the most skillful surgeon, but when he arrived, my husband was dead. No mortal could die in a more Christian disposition or with more courage than he did, after having received the sacrament in a manner truly edifying. I was not present when he expired, for out of tenderness he made me retire. He was above twenty hours unconscious and in the agonies of death. It was in the morning of July 21, 1676, that he died. Next day I entered into my closet, in which was the image of my divine spouse, the Lord Jesus Christ. I renewed my marriage conduct, and added thereto a vow of chastity, with a promise to make it perpetual, if Mr. Betrothed, my director, would permit me. After that I was filled with great joy, which was new to me, as for a long time past I had been plunged in the deepest bitterness. As soon as I heard that my husband had expired, O oh my God, I cried, Thou hast broken my bonds, and I will offer thee a sacrifice of praise. After that, I remained in a deep silence, both exterior and interior, quite dry and without any support. I could neither weep nor speak. My mother-in-law said very fine things and was very much commended for it by everyone. They were offended at my silence, which they attributed to want of resignation. A friar told me that everyone admired the fine acts which my mother-in-law did. But as for me, they heard me say nothing, that I must sacrifice my loss to God, but I could not say one single word. Let me strive as I would. I was indeed very much exhausted. Although I was but recently delivered of my daughter, yet I attended and sat up with my husband four and twenty nights before his death. I was more than a year after in recovering from fatigue, joined to my great weakness and pain, both of body and of mind. The great depression or dryness and stupidity which I was in was such that I could not say a word about God. It bore me down in such a manner that I could hardly speak. However, I entered for some moments into the admiration of thy goodness, O my God. I saw well that my crosses would not fail since my mother-in-law had survived my husband. Also I was still tied in having two children given me in so short a time before my husband's death, which evidently appeared the effect of divine wisdom. For had I only my eldest son, I would have put him in a college and have gone myself into the convent of the Benedictines, and so frustrated all the designs of God upon me. I was willing to show the esteem I had for my husband in causing the most magnificent funeral to be made for him 
at my own expense. I paid off the legacies he had left. My mother-in-law violently opposed everything I could do for securing my own interests. I had nobody to apply to for advice or help, for my brother would not give me the least assistance. I was ignorant of business affairs, but God, independent of my natural understandings, always made me fit for everything that pleased Him, and supplied me with such a perfect intelligence that I succeeded. I omitted not the least minutia, and was surprised that in these matters I should know without ever having learned. I digested all my papers and regulated all my affairs without assistance from anyone. My husband had abundance of writings deposited in his hands. I took an exact inventory of them and sent them severally to the owners, which, without divine assistance, would have been very difficult for me, because my husband, having been a long time sick, everything was in the greatest confusion. This gained me the reputation of being a skillful woman. There was one matter of great importance, a number of persons who had been contending at law for several years applied to my husband to settle their affairs. Though it was not properly the business of a gentleman, yet they applied to him because he had both understanding and prudence. And as he had a love for several of them, he consented. There were twenty actions one upon another, and in all twenty-two persons concerned, who could not get any end put to their differences, by reason of new incidents continually falling out. My husband charged himself with getting lawyers to examine their papers but died before he could make any procedure therein. After his death, I sent for them to give them their papers, but they would not receive them, begging of me that I would accommodate them and prevent their ruin. It appeared to me as ridiculous as impossible to undertake an affair of so great consequence and which would require so long a discussion, nevertheless, relying on the strength and wisdom of God, I consented. I shut myself up about thirty days for all these affairs, without ever going out, but to mass and to my meals. The arbitration being at length prepared, they all signed it without seeing it. They were all so well satisfied therewith that they could not forbear publishing it everywhere. It was God alone who did those things, for after they were settled I knew nothing about them. And if I now hear any talk of such things, to me it sounds like Arabic. End of chapter 22 verse 1volume 1 chapter 23 of the autobiography of madame kion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org being now a widow my crosses which one would have thought should have abated only grease that turbulent domestic i have often mentioned 
instead of growing milder now that she depended on me became more furious than ever in our house she had amassed a good fortune and i settled on her besides an annuity for the remainder of her life for the services she had done my husband she swelled with vanity and haughtiness having been used to sit up so much with an invalid she had taken to drink wine to keep up her spirits this had now passed into a habit as she grew aged and weak a very little of fit affected her i tried to hide this fault but it grew so that it could not be concealed i spoke of it to her confessor in order that he might try softly and artfully to reclaim her from it but instead of profiting by her director's advice she was outrageous against me my mother-in-law who could hardly bear the fault of intemperance and had often spoken to me about it now joined in reproaching me and vindicating her this strange creature when any company came would cry out with all her might that i had dishonored her thrown her into despair and would be the cause of her damnation as i was taking the ready course to my own yet god gave me an unbounded patience i answered only with mildness and charity all her passionate invectives giving her besides every possible mark of my affection if any other maid came to wait on me she would drive her back in a rage crying out that i hated her on account of the affection with which she had served my husband when she had not a mind to come i was obliged to serve myself and when she did come it was to chide me and make a noise when i was very unwell as was often the case this girl would appear to be in despair from hence i thought it was from thee o lord that all this came upon me without thy permission she was scarcely capable of such uncountable conduct she seemed not sensible of any faults but always to think herself in the right all those whom thou hast made use of to cause me to suffer thought they were rendering service to thee in so doing before my husband's death i went to paris on purpose to see monsieur bedraud who had been of very little service to me as a director not knowing my state and i being incapable of telling him of it he grew weary of the charge at length he gave it up and wrote to me to take another director i made no doubt but god had revealed to him my wicked state and this desertion of me seemed a more certain mark of my reprobation this was during the life of my husband but now my renewed solicitations and his sympathy with me on my husband's death prevailed on him to resume my direction which to me still proved of very little service i went again to paris to see him while there i visited him twelve or fifteen times without being able to tell him anything of my condition i told him indeed that i wanted some ecclesiastic to educate my son to rid him of his bad habits 
and of the wrong impressions he had conceived against me. He found one for me of whom he had received very good recommendations. I went to make a retreat with Mr. Betro and Madame de C. All the time he spoke to me not a quarter of an hour at most. As he saw that I said nothing to him, for indeed I knew not what to say, as I had not spoken to him of the favors which God had conferred on me, not from a desire to conceal them, but because the Lord did not permit me to do it, as he had over me only the designs of death. He therefore spoke to such as he looked upon to be more advanced in grace. He let me alone as one from whom there was nothing to be done. So well did God hide from him the situation of my soul in order to make me suffer that he wanted to refer me, thinking that I had not the spirit of prayer, and that Mr. Granger was mistaken when she told him I had. I did what I could to obey him, but it was entirely impossible. On this account I was displeased with myself, because I believed Mr. Betroth rather than my experience. Through this whole retreat, my inclination, which I discerned only by my resistance to it, was to rest in silence and nakedness of thought. In the settling of my mind therein, I feared I was disobeying the orders of my director. This made me think that I had fallen from grace. I kept myself in a state of nothingness, content with my poor low decree of prayer. Without envying the higher decree of others, of which I judged myself unworthy, I would have, however, desire much to do the will of God and to please Him, but despair altogether of ever attaining that desirable end. There was in the place where I lived and had been for some years one whose doctor was suspected. He possessed a dignity in the church which always obliged me to have a deference for him, as he understood how averse I was to all who were suspected of unsoundness in the faith and knowing that i had some credit in the place he used his utmost efforts to engage me in his sentiments i answered him with so much clearness and energy that he had not a word to reply this increased his desire to win me in order to do it to contract a friendship for me he continued to importune me for two years and a half. As he was very polite and of an obliging temper and had a good share of learning, I did not mistrust him. I even conceived a hope of his conversion in which I found myself mistaken. I then ceased going near him. He came to inquire why he could see me no more. At that time he was so agreeable to my sick husband in, in his assiduities about him that I could not avoid him, though I thought the shortest and best way for me would be break off all acquaintance with him which I did after the death of my husband. Mr. Betrothe would not permit me to do it before, when he now saw that he could not renew it. He and his party raised up strong persecutions against me. This gentleman, 
had at that time a method among them by which they soon knew who were of their party and who were opposite. They sent to one another circular letters, by means of which, in a very little time, they cried me down on every side, after a very strange manner. Yet this gave me little trouble. I was glad of my new liberty, intending never again to enter into an intimacy with any one, which would give me so much difficulty to break. This inability I was now in of doing those exterior acts of charity I had done before served this person with a pretext to publish that it was owing to him I had formerly done them. Willing to ascribe to himself the merit of what God alone, by his grace, had made me do. He went so far as to preach against me publicly as one who had been a bright pattern to the town, but was now become a scandal to it. Several times he preached very offensive things. Though I was present at those sermons, and they were enough to weigh me down with confusion, for they offended all that heard them, I could not be troubled. I carried in myself my own condemnation beyond utterance. I thought I merited abundantly worse than all he could say of me, and that if all men knew me, they would trample me under their feet. My reputation then was plastered by the industry of this ecclesiastic. He caused all such as passed for persons of piety to declare against me. I thought he and they were in the right, and therefore quietly bore it all. Confused like a criminal that dares not lift up his eyes, I looked upon the virtue of others with respect. I saw no fault in others, and no virtue in myself. When any happened to praise me, it was like a heavy blow struck at me, and I said in myself, They little know my miseries, and from what state I have fallen. When any blamed me, I agreed to it, as right and just. Nature wanted sometimes to get out of such an abject condition but could not find any way. If I tried to make an outward appearance of righteousness by the practice of some good thing, my heart in secret rebuked me as guilty of hypocrisy in wanting to appear what I was not, and God did not permit that to succeed. Oh, how excellent are the crosses of providence! All other crosses are of no value. I was often very ill and in danger of death, and knew not how to prepare myself for it. Several persons of piety who had been acquainted with me wrote to me about those things which the gentleman spread about me. I did not offer to justify myself, although I knew myself innocent of the things whereof they accused me. One day, being in the greatest desolation and distress, I opened the New Testament on these words, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That for a little time gave me some relief. End of chapter 23, volume 1
of the autobiography of Madame Kion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion, Volume One, Chapter Twenty Four. The Lord took from me all the sensibility which I had for the creatures or things created, even in an instant, as one takes off a rope. After that time I had none for any whatsoever. Though he had done me that favor, for which I can never be sufficiently grateful, I was however, neither more contented, nor less confused by it. My God seemed to be so estranged and displeased with me, that there remained nothing but the grief of having lost His blessed presence through my fault. The loss of my reputation, every day increasing, became sensible to my heart, though I was not allowed to justify or bewail myself. As I became always more impotent for every kind of exterior works, as I could not go to see the poor, nor stay at church, nor practice prayer, as I became colder toward God, in proportion as I was more sensible of my wrong steps, all this destroyed me the more, both in my own eyes and in those of others. There were some very considerable gentlemen who made proposals for me, and even such persons, as according to the rules of fashion, ought not to think of me. They presented themselves during the very depth of my outward and inward desolation. At first it appeared to me a means of drawing me out of the distress I was in, but it seemed to me then, notwithstanding my pains of body and mind, that if a king had presented himself to me, I would have refused him with pleasure to show thee, O my God, that with all my miseries I was resolved to be thine alone. If thou wouldst not accept of me, I should at least have the consolation of having been faithful to thee to the utmost of my power. For as to my inward state, I never mentioned it to anybody. I never spoke thereof nor of the suitors, though my mother-in-law would say that if I did not marry, it was because none would have me. It was sufficient for me that thou, O my God, knewest that I sacrificed them to thee, without saying a word to anybody, especially one whose high birth and amiable exterior qualities might have tempered both my vanity and inclination. Oh, could I but have hoped to become agreeable to thee, such a hope would have been like a change from hell to heaven. So far was I from presuming to hope for it, that I fear this sea of affliction might also be followed by everlasting misery in the loss of thee. I dare not even desire to enjoy thee. I only desire not to offend thee. I was for five or six weeks at the last extremity. I could not take any nourishment. A spoonful of broth made me faint. My voice was so gone that when they put their ears close to my mouth, 
they could scarcely distinguish my words. I could not see any hope of salvation, yet was not unwilling to die. I bore a strong impression that the longer I lived, the more I would sin. Of the two, I thought I would rather choose hell than sin. All the good which God made me do now seemed to me evil or full of fault. All my prayers, penances, alms, and charities seemed to rise up against me and heighten my condemnation. I thought they appeared on the side of God on my own and from all creatures one general condemnation. My conscience was a witness against me which I could not appease. What may appear strange, the sins of my youth did not then give me any pain at all. They did not rise up in judgment against me, but there appeared one universal testimony against all the good I had done and all the sentiments of evil I had entertained. If I went to confessors, I could tell them nothing of my condition. If I could have told them, they would have not understood me. They would have regarded as eminent virtues what, O oh my God, thy eyes, all pure and chaste, rejected as infidelity. It was then that I felt the truth of what thou hast said that thou judgest our righteousness. Oh, how pure art thou! Who can comprehend it? It was then that I turned my eyes on every side to see what way succor might come to me. But my succor could come no way but from him who made heaven and earth. As I saw, there was no safety for me, or spiritual health in myself. I enter into a secret complacency in seeing no good in myself whereon to rest or presume for salvation. The nearer my destruction appeared, the more I found in God Himself wherewith to augment my trust and confidence, notwithstanding He seemed so justly irritated against me. It seemed to me that I had in Jesus Christ all that was wanting in myself. O ye stout and righteous men, observe as much as ye please of excellence in what ye have done to the glory of God. As for me, I only glory in my infirmities, since they have merited for me such a Savior. All my troubles joined to the loss of my reputation, which yet was not so great as I apprehended, it being only among a party, rendered me so unable to eat that it seemed wonderful how I lived. In four days I did not eat as much as would make one very moderate repast. I was obliged to keep my bed through mere weakness, my body being no longer able to support the burden laid upon it. If I had thought, known, or heard tell that there had ever been such a state as mine, it would have exceedingly relieved me. My very pain appeared to me to be seen. Spiritual books, when I tried to read them, all contributed only to augment it. I saw in myself none of those states which they set down. I did not so much as comprehend them. And when they treated the pains of certain states, I was very far from attributing any of them to myself. I said to myself, these persons 
feel the pains of divine operation but as to me i sin and feel nothing but my own wicked state i could have wished to separate the sin from the confusion of sin and provided i had not offended god all would have been easy to me a slight sketch of my last miseries which i am glad to let you know because in their beginning i omitted many infidelities having had too much of an earnest attachment vain complaisance unprofitable and tedious conversations though self-love and nature made a sort of necessity for them but toward the latter part i could not have borne a speech too human nor the listing of the kind end of chapter twenty four volume one volume one chapter twenty five of the autobiography of madame kion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the autobiography of madame kion by jean kion volume one chapter twenty five the first religious person that god made use of to draw me to himself to whom according to his desire i had written from time to time wrote to me in the depth of my distress desiring me to write to him no more signifying his disapprobation of what came from me and that i displeased god greatly a father a jesuit who had esteemed me much wrote to me in like manner no doubt it was by thy permission they thus contributed to complete my desolation i thank them for their charity and commanded myself to their prayers it was then so indifferent to me to be decried of everybody even of the greatest saints that it added but little to my pain the pain of displeasing god and the strong propensity i felt in myself to all sorts of faults caused me most lively and sensible pain i had been accustomed from the beginning to dryness and privation i even prefer it to the state of abounding because i knew that i must seek god above all i had even at the first beginnings an instinct of my inmost soul to pass over every manner of thing whatsoever to leave the gifts to run after the giver but at this time my spirit and senses were in such a manner struck by thy permission o my lord who wert pleased to destroy me without mercy that the farther i went the more everything appeared to me a sin even crosses appeared to me no more crosses but real faults i thought i drew them all on myself by my imprudent words and actions i was like those who looking through a colored glass behold everything of the same color with which it is stained had i been able to perform my exterior acts as formerly or penances for my evil it would have relieved me i was forbidden to do the latter besides i grew so timorous and felt in myself such a weakness as made it appear impossible for me to do them 
I looked on them with horror. I found myself now so weak and incapable of anything of the kind. I omit many things, both of providences of the Lord in my favor and of racked paths through which I was obliged to pass. But as I have only one general view, I leave them in the knowledge of the Lord only. Afterward, being forsaken of my director, the goldness toward me which I remarked in the persons conducted by him gave me no more trouble. Nor, indeed, the estrangement of all the creatures on account of my inward humiliation. My brother also joined with those who exclaimed against me, even though he had never seen them before. I believe it was the Lord who conducted things in this way, for my brother has worth, and undoubtedly thought he did well in acting thus. I was obliged to go about some business to a town where some near relations of my mother-in-law lived. How did I find things change there? When I was there before, they entertained me in a most elegant and obliging manner, regaling me from house to house with emulation. Now they treated me with the utmost contempt, saying they did it to revenge what I bade their relation suffer. As I saw the thing went so far that notwithstanding all my care and endeavors to please her, I had not been able to succeed. I resolved to come to an explanation with her. I told her that there was a current report that I treated her ill, though I made it my study to give her every mark of my esteem. If the report were true, I desire her to allow me to remove from her, for that I will not choose to stay to give her pain, but only with a quite contrary view. She answered very coldly that I might do what I would, for she had not spoken about it, but was resolved to live apart from me. This was fairly giving me my discharge, and I thought of taking my measures privately to retire. As I had not, since my widowhood, made any visits, but such as were of pure necessity or charity, there were found too many discontented spirits who made a party with her against me. The Lord required of me an inviolable secrecy of all my pains, both of exterior and interior. There is nothing which makes nature die so much as to find neither support nor consolation. In short, I saw myself obliged to go out in the middle of winter with my children and my daughter's nurse. At that time, there was no house empty in the town, so the Benedictines offered me an apartment in theirs. I was now in great strait, on one side fearing lest I was shunning the cross, on the other side thinking it unreasonable to impose my state on one to whom it was only painful. Besides what I have related of her behavior, which still continued, when I went into the country to take a little repose, she complained that I left her alone. If I desire her to come thither, she will not. If I said I dare not ask her to come, for fear of incommoding her by changing her bed, she replied, it was only an excuse because I will not have her go, and that I only went to 
be away from her. When I heard that she was displeased at my being in the country, I returned to the town. Then she could not bear to speak to me or to see me. I accosted her without appearing to notice how she received it. Instead of making me any answer, she turned her head another way. I often sent her my coach, desiring her to come and spend a day in the country. She sent it back empty, without any answer. If I passed some days there without sending it, she complained aloud. In short, all I did to please her soured her. God so permitting it. She had in the main a good heart, but was troubled with an uneasy temper. And I do not fail to think myself under much obligation to her. Being with her on Christmas Day, I said to her with much affection, My mother, on this day was the King of Peace born, to bring it to us. I beg peace of you in his name. I think that touched her, though she will not let it appear. The ecclesiastic whom I had met with at home, far from strengthening and comforting me, did nothing but waken and afflict me, telling me that I ought not to suffer certain things. I had no credit enough to discharge any domestic, however defective or culpable. As soon as any of them were warned to go away, she sided with them, and all her friends interfered. As I was ready to go off, one of my mother-in-law's friends, a man of worth who had always an esteem for me, without daring to show it, having heard it, was much afraid lest I should leave the town, for the removal of my alms, he thought, would be a loss to the country. He resolved to speak to my mother-in-law in the softest manner she could, for he knew her. After he had spoken to her, she said that she would not put me away, but if I went, she would not hinder me. After this, he came to see me and desired me to go and make an excuse to her in order to condemn her. I told him I should be willing to make a hundred, although I did not know about what that I did it continually about everything which made her uneasy. But that was not now the matter, for I make no complaint of her, but thought it not proper for me to continue with her to give her pain, that it was but just that I should contribute to her case. However, he went with me into her room. Then I told her that I begged her pardon. If ever I had displeased her in anything, that it had never been my intention to do it, that I desire her before this gentleman who was her friend to tell me wherein I had given her any offense. Here God permitted she made a declaration of the truth in his presence. She said she was not a person to suffer herself to be offended, that she had no other complaint against me, but that, that, but that I did not love her, and that I wished her dead. I answered her that these thoughts were far from my heart, so far from it that I should be glad by my best care and attendance on her to prolong her days. 
that my affection was real, but that she never would be persuaded to believe it. Whatever testimonies I could give, so long as he hearkened to people who spoke to her against me, that she had with her a maid who, far from showing me any respect, treated me ill, so far as to push me when she wanted to pass by. She had done it at church, making me give way to her with as much violence as contempt. Several times also in my room, grating me with her words, that I had never complained of it, because such a temper might one day give her trouble. She took the girl's part. Nevertheless, we embraced, and it was left so. Soon after, when I was in the country, this maid, having me no more to vent her chagrins on, behaved in such a manner to my mother-in-law that she could not bear it. She immediately put her out of doors. I must say here on my mother-in-law's behalf that she had both sense and virtue, and except certain faults, which persons who do not practice prayer are liable to, she had good qualities. Perhaps I caused crosses to her without intending it, and she to me without knowing it. I hope what I write will not be seen by any who may be offended with it, or who may not be in a condition to see these matters in God. That gentleman who had used me so ill for breaking off my acquaintance with him among his penitents had one who, for affairs which befell her husband, was obliged to quit the country. He himself was accused of the same things which he had so liberally and unjustly accused me, and even things much worse, and with more noise and outcry. Though I well knew all this, God granted me the favor never to make his downfall the subject of my discourse. On the contrary, when any spoke to me of it, I pitied him, and said what I could in mitigation of his case. And God governed my heart so well that it never offered to go into any vain joy at seeing him overtaken and oppressed with those kind of evils which he had been so assiduous in endeavoring to bring upon me. Though I knew that my mother-in-law was informed of it all, I never spoke to her about it, or about the sad confusions he had caused in a certain family. End of chapter 25, volume 1